time. Thank you. Now that House oversight hearing into conditions at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, you'll hear first from wounded soldiers and a family member, later previous commanders of the facility and top Army officials. Quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs. Field hearing titled, Is This Any Way to Treat Our Troops? The Care and Condition of Wounded Soldiers at Walter Reed will come to order. I ask unanimous consent uh, that the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member of the Subcommittee, as well as the a ranking minority member of the committee be allowed to have five minutes to make opening statements. Without objection, that is ordered. But I would also like to first introduce the Under Secretary Peter Guerin, who would uh, like to welcome people here in a brief statement. Mr. Guerin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I, I'm the Under Secretary of the Army. Now, next Friday, I'll, I'll be the Acting Secretary of the Army. Last Friday night, the Secretary asked me to take on the health care issues for the Army. In the meantime, not wait until I'm the Acting Secretary next on behalf of the Army, I want to welcome all of you to Walter Reed. Uh, as a former member of Congress, I want you to know I appreciate and value the role this Congress and this committee plays in the life of our Army. The treasures, the partnership we have with the Congress. We understand the Constitution has forged the partnership from the beginning of this country over the long century lab between the Congress and our United States Army. Uh, we have let some soldiers down and working with the Congress and with the leadership of the Army all the way down to the lowest ranking civilian or uniform military, we're going to fix that problem. In fact, we're in the process of fixing it. Your involvement is going to help us do that. We're glad so many of you are here today, shown this kind of interest in Walter Reed. So many of you have been out here many, many times and a part of the life of Walter Reed. We've worked with members and staff over the last several years in dealing with, with related problems. And, and we appreciate very much the role that the Congress plays. It's a vow that's part of the soldier's creed. I will never leave a fallen comrade. That's the, on the battlefield, it's in the hospital, it's an outpatient place. And that is part of the soul of, of every soldier. And any time that vow is broken, I can tell you, it hurts the heart of the Army. The men and women at Walter Reed are dedicated professionals. They make considerable sacrifice, both financial and personal, to meet the needs of the patients here at Walter Reed, to meet the needs of the families. They provide excellent health care. When it comes to wounded warriors, they set the standard for the world in health care. They do this and turn down offers in private industry to make several times more money. They do it because they believe in the soldiers' creed. They are dedicated to their fallen comrades. And it hurts them deeply when they see any member of this service. <coughs> but I, on behalf of the staff here, I also offer this welcome. They look forward to working with you. I want to thank them for their work. And again, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Chairman Weissman, thank you, I appreciate your being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Guerin. A little bit of house cleaning here first. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee may be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection, that's ordered. I also ask that the following written statements be made part of the hearing record. The Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, Joe Wilson, Social Worker, Psychiatric Continuity Service, Sergeant David Yancey, Mississippi National Guard, Sergeant Archie and Barbara Benware, John Allen, former Sergeant First Class, North Carolina National Guard, and Marine Sergeant Ryan Groves of Ohio. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Maryland, Representative Elijah Cummings, and the delegate from the District of Columbia, Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton, members of the full Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, be permitted to participate in the hearing. In accordance with our committee practices, they'll be recognized after all members of the subcommittee. Without objection, so ordered. So getting down to business, let me first and foremost uh, welcome everybody here and thank the brave soldiers at Walter Reed for allowing us to have this hearing at this facility. Thank you all for your service and your patriotism and your courage. Uh, everybody here is mindful uh, of what you've done and how you've answered the call for this country without distinction for party uh, or any other factor. You're an inspiration to all of us. 
And from the bottom of our hearts, we appreciate all that you've done for your country and for each of us. I also want to welcome the members of the National Security and Foreign Affairs Subcommittee. It was vital that we convene a hearing at Walter Reed so that we'd be able to see and hear for ourselves whether or not what we've seen reported uh, is actually accurate and true. While I intend that this subcommittee will hold, conduct hearings and investigations into many areas of defense and homeland security and foreign policy, I can think of no more important topic for our very first hearing than the proper care of our nation's wounded soldiers. I'd like to start by playing a short video clip from the WashingtonPost.com website that I think indicates for us the seriousness of this matter. Marine Sergeant Ryan Groves told us he thought that the wounded at Walter Reed were treated more like frontline troops than outpatients. His mom came to be with him and he got hell for it, but he fought back and she stayed. Staff Sergeant Dan Shannon loves the U.S. Army, but he couldn't understand why they didn't better track of soldiers, so he designed his own system for keeping track of him. Sergeant Shannon has a wife and three kids, but he also has a bad case of PTSD, so the doctor gave him a separate room because his son's loud toys set him off. Eventually, the Army made the entire family live in one small room. Mm. Shannon was motivated to help out when this corporal, Jeremy Harper, who was only 19 years old when he died of alcohol poisoning. He was found in his room New Year's Day, 2005. Lots of soldiers told us they got the wrong medical records. Archie Benware, in the National Guard, got the gynecological report from a female soldier sent to him. Building 18 was built in the mid-30s. Now they're housing soldiers there. They talk about it as a depressing, isolating place. Specialist Jeremy Duncan was rather surprised when mold started invading his room and he couldn't get anybody to fix it. Duncan almost died in Iraq. He's been in Walter Reed for more than a year. He's very grateful for the medical treatment he's received. He's about to get a new ear. Walter Reed has long been perceived as a model of taking care of our nation's soldiers when they return from battle. Now, the Secretary is absolutely correct that people respect and honor the service of the medical personnel and other staff that are here at the hospital. Uh, but when we look at the unsanitary conditions and some of the other situations of the living quarters, uh, we find it appalling. But we also realize that not only is it flat wrong, that's the tip of the iceberg. For too many occasions, the soldiers at Walter Reed wait months, if not years, in a sort of a limbo. And they must navigate through broken administrative processes and layers upon layers of bureaucracy to get their basic tasks accomplished. Today, we're going to hear firsthand of the conditions and the lack of respect for our soldiers and their families. I want to thank Staff Sergeant Dan Shannon, and Corporal Del McLeod and his wife, Annette, and Specialist Jeremy Duncan for your bravery, for your service, for your sacrifice, and for sharing your experiences with us here in this panel today. I understand that you're frustrated. I think we all understand that. Uh, and we respect the fact that we understand why you are. But let me be clear. This is absolutely the wrong way to treat our troops, and serious reforms need to happen immediately. Over the past month, the perception of Walter Reed has gone from the flagship of our military health system to a glaring problem. This subcommittee wants some answers. I want to thank Major General Waitman and former Commander of Walter Reed, Lieutenant General Kiley, and the Army's current Surgeon General, and also a former Commander at Walter Reed. I want to thank General Cody, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and the Army's point person on this issue, for being with us today, as will be General Shoemaker. I look forward to hearing from all of you why our wounded soldiers have been not getting the care and the living conditions that they deserve. I also want to hear what we're going to do about it in the future. I want to stress that this is an investigative hearing and not an inquisition. Our purpose is to get to the bottom of things and to get honest answers. And it will take our cooperative efforts, all of us working together, to make sure that a broken system is fixed and fixed quickly. That all being said, I do have serious concerns and many, many questions. First, is this just another horrific consequence of the terrible planning that went into our invasion of Iraq? Did the fact that our top civilian leaders predicted a short war where we'd be greeted as liberators lead to a lack of planning in terms of adequate resources and facilities devoted to the care of our wounded soldiers? Are we headed down the same path again with the President's surge? Or are we prepared this time for the increase of injuries, patients, and wounded veterans? What concrete steps have been taken and are being taken as a reaction to the surge to make sure that every soldier gets cared for properly? Did an ideological push for privatization put the care of our wounded heroes at risk? The September 2006 memorandum that this committee has obtained 
describes how the Army's decision to privatize was causing an exodus of, and I quote, highly skilled and experienced personnel from Walter Reed, and that there was a fear that patient care services are at risk of mission failure. That the fact that Walter Reed is scheduled to close in 2011 because of BRAC, base realignment and closure uh, process, contribute to an unacceptable conditions at Building 18 and elsewhere. And with a Defense Department budget of $450 billion and more, this is not a case of there not being enough money to take care of our wounded soldiers. This is a case of a lack of proper prioritization and focus. More and more evidence is appearing to indicate that senior officials were aware for several years of the types of problems that were recently expressed in the excellent reporting by the Washington Post reporters. These are not new or sudden problems. Rats and cockroaches don't burrow and infest overnight. Mold and holes in ceilings don't occur in a week. And complaints of bureaucratic indifference have been reported for years. Moreover, this committee under former Chairman Davis and Chairman Shays have been investigating over the past several years problems faced by our wounded soldiers, including those at Walter Reed. And I want to thank those members for their leadership so far. I also want to thank Congressman Peter Welch for Vermont and others who insisted that this committee have its first hearing out here at Walter Reed so we could see firsthand the conditions at question. Where does the buck stop? There appears to be a patent developing here that we've seen before. First deny, then try to cover up, then designate a fall guy. In this case, I have concerns that the Army is literally trying to whitewash over the problems. I appreciate the first steps that have been taken to rectify the problems at Walter Reed and to hold those responsible accountable. We need a sustained focus here, and much more needs to be done. I also, unfortunately, feel that these problems go well beyond the walls of Walter Reed, and that there are problems systemic throughout the military health care system. And as we send more and more troops into Iraq and Afghanistan, these problems are only going to get worse, not better, and we should re be prepared to deal with them. Let me conclude by thanking all the soldiers who are able to be with us here today for their sacrifice on all of our behalf. We all agree that our soldiers deserve the best possible care, so let's give them that respect and gratitude that they rightly deserve. They've earned it with their dedication, with their patriotism, and with their sacrifice. With that, I yield to Mr. Shays, uh, or Mr. Davis, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to defer my statement. I, I, I know we've got a short agenda time, and uh, we'll just have one on each side, and uh, so I would uh, welcome Mr. Davis making our statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shays. And let me thank Chairman Waxman and uh, Chairman Tierney for agreeing to convene this hearing at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. For too long, complaints about substandard and disjointed care for wounded soldiers have been treated as distant abstractions. Here, no one should be distracted by numbing statistics, soulless technical jargon, impersonal flow charts, or rosy good news action plans. Here, we get an unfiltered look at a tortuous system that has proved so far stubbornly incapable of reaching the standard of care this nation is honor-bound to provide returning warriors. We meet in the grounds of a world-class, world-renowned medical institution. Walter Reed has a venerable tradition of scientific advancement and clinical success. No one cared for here yesterday, today, or tomorrow should doubt the skill and dedication of the doctors, nurses, and administrative staff who labor every day to save lives and repair broken bodies and minds. The problems that bring us here today are the product of institutional indifference, not a lack of individual commitment. Recent reports of decrepit facilities and dysfunctional outpatient procedures at Walter Reed amplified oversight work this committee started in 2004. Pay and personnel systems that got it wrong far more than it got it right were inflicting financial friendly fire on those returning from war. Some of those erroneous dunning notices found their way here. Men and women already struggling to regain their physical health were also being forced to fight their own government to protect their financial well-being. Members of the National Guard and Reserve units have a particularly difficult time navigating this Byzantine, stovepiped, paper-choked process that was never intended to deal with so many for so long. The charts that we have uh, lay out uh, only parts of the, med uh, of the med hold system. Apparently, some other pre-war planning errors, uh, the, the Pentagon somehow failed to anticipate that deploying unprecedented numbers of reserve component troops into combat would produce an unprecedented flow of casualties. As a result, the Defense Department has been scrambling ever since to lash together last century procedures and systems to care for returning citizen soldiers. But institutional habits and biases have proven remarkably impervious to demands for change. It took well over a year 
to stand up an ombudsman program to help guide soldiers and their families through a complex, confusing, and frustrating medical and administrative labyrinth involving mountains of forms and multiple Army commands. Last October, a systems analysis review team inspection of Walter Reed found no process to track submitted work orders, particularly for Building 18. They pronounced the facility otherwise safe and secure. That must have been remarkably fast-growing mold that we found in the Washington Post in Building 18. Two years ago, the Government Reform Committee heard testimony that concluded Army guidance for processing patients in medical hold units does not clearly define organizational responsibilities or performance standards. The Army has not adequately educated soldiers about medical and personnel processing or adequately trained Army personnel responsible for helping soldiers. The Army lacks an integrated medical and personnel system to provide visibility over injured soldiers and, as a result, sometimes actually loses track of soldiers in where they are in the process. And the Army lacks compassionate customer-friendly service. The last one says it all and sadly appears to be as true today as in 2005. And these problems are not unique to Walter Reed. Here, uncertainty over the use of contractors or decisions by the Base Closure and Realignment Commission may have contributed to staff turnover and attrition. But the crushing complexity and glacial pace of outpatient procedures and medical evaluation boards are Army-wide problems. Building 18 is just one visible symptom of a far more insidious and pervasive malady. All the plaster and paint in the world won't cure a system that seems institutionally predisposed to treat wounded soldiers like inconveniences rather than heroes. On the long road home from war, this is a place wounded soldiers and their families should be embraced, not abandoned. They should be healed and nurtured, not left to languish or fend for themselves against a faceless bureaucratic hydra. What will transform this Un dysfunctional, uncaring arrangement into the compassionate, effective medical and military operation wounded <laughs> soldiers deserve? All our witnesses today will help us find the answer to that question. Those in our first panel speak from hard personal experience. They have every reason to be disillusioned, even bitter, about frustrations and indignities they endured or witnessed while captive to a broken process. Their testimony is one more selfless act of bravery, and we are profoundly grateful for their willingness to speak out. Thank you, Mr. Davis. The subcommittee will now receive some testimony from the witnesses before us today. I'd like to start by introducing those witnesses on the first panel. We have Staff Sergeant John Daniel of Dan Shannon, a resident of Walter Reed since he was injured near Ramadi, Iraq in November 2004. We have Mrs. Annette McLeod and her husband, Specialist Wendell Dell McLeod, Jr., from Chesterfield, South Carolina. Actually, Mrs. McLeod will be testifying. Dell is with us here today. The specialist Jeremy Duncan, currently an outpatient at Walter Reed resident, residence who was housed in Building 18. Welcome to all of you and thank you for coming and sharing your experiences here today. It's the policy of this subcommittee to uh, swear you in before we testify, so I'm going to ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will please reflect that all of the witnesses so swore. And I'm going to ask that each of you now give a brief statement. We'll start uh, from my left with uh, Staff Sergeant Shannon. And Mrs. McLeod and Specialist Duncan. Uh, the statements for five minutes, if you can, please try to retain your marks. Davis to my left is going to th throw something in the air to get my attention when you get near that point in time, and I'll, I'll just try to give you a signal. But we do want to allow you to fully express yourself. So, Staff Sergeant Shannon, if you'd please start. Yes, sir. And I apologize. I do have a written statement so that I can stay within those time constraints. And, of course, more information with the, uh, with the written statement I submitted. All of the written statements have been entered in the record and, and will be there. Is your microphone on, sir? Just, ta just tap it. Let's just see if. Yeah. Yes, okay. Let's Thank you. You might okay. want to move it a little bit closer to you if you could, and, and that would be helpful. Very good. Better? Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today on issues at Walter Reed Medical Center. My name is Staff Sergeant John Daniel Shannon. I do go by my middle name. Um, what has brought me to speak is my personal ethic as a professional soldier. I will not see young men and women who have had their lives shattered in service to their country receive anything less than dignity and respect. I was wounded while serving in Iraq with the 1st Battalion, 503rd Infantry Regiment. We were conducting operations out of Habaniya, Iraq, and had moved to combat outpost, a small compound on the southeast side of Ramadi. On November 13, 2004, I suffered a gunshot wound to the head from an AK-47 during a firefight with insurgent forces near Saddam's mosque. The result of that wound was primarily a traumatic brain injury and the loss of my left eye. 
I arrived at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center's Ward 58 on or about the 16th of November 2004. I was just discharged in outpatient status on approximately the 18th of November 2004. Upon my discharge, hospital staff gave me a photocopied map of the installation and told me to go to, go to the Malone House where I would live while an outpatient. I was extremely disoriented and wandered around while looking for someone to direct me to the Malone House, and eventually I found it. I had been given a couple of weeks appointments and some other paperwork upon leaving Ward 58, and I went to all of my appointments during that time. After these appointments, I sat in my room for another couple of weeks wondering when someone would contact me about my continuing medical care. Finally, I went through the paperwork I was given and started calling all the phone numbers until I reached my case manager who promptly got me the appointments I needed. I soon made contact with the medical holding company. At that time, I was in process and assigned to the 2nd Platoon Man Hold Company. I was informed that my medical evaluation board slash physical evaluation board would not proceed until my face was put back together. This process is important to me because the result of the evaluation determines the percentage of my disability. During the time my injuries were being fixed, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms started surfacing. I was informed that the medical retirement process would not proceed until the PTSD was medicinally controlled. Months later, I was informed that my medical board paperwork, um, had, my medical board had to be restarted because my information had been lost. I began meeting with my new physical evaluation counselor, Mr. Geis, in late January and early February. He informed that my MEB needed to be stopped again until the plastic surgery and ocular prosthetic procedures were finished. Therefore, two years after first being admitted to Walter Reed, I'm hearing the same thing about the process that I heard when I first began it two years ago. I want to leave this place. I've seen so many soldiers get so frustrated with the process that they will sign anything presented to them just so they can get on with their lives. We have almost no advocacy that is not working for the government. No one that we can talk to about this process who is knowledgeable and we can trust is going to give us fair treatment and informed guidance. My physical evaluation counselor and the MEB PEB process both work for the government and have its interests, not our interests, in mind, in my opinion. Danny Soto, who works in the Malone House as an independent advocate for those of us going through the process, is priceless in the assistance he gives. But he is only one man. The system can't be trusted. And soldiers get less than they deserve from a system seemingly designed to run and run to cut the costs associated with fighting this war. The truly sad thing is that surviving veterans from every war we've ever fought can tell the same basic story. A story about neglect, lack of advocacy, and frustration with the military bureaucracy. Thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to share my experiences with this committee. Thank you, Staff Sergeant. Uh, Mrs. McLeod. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for holding this hearing today. My name is Annette McLeod and I am testifying today because my husband Wendell has been through the nightmare of the Army medical system. I'm glad that you care about what happened to my husband after he was injured in the line of duty because for a long time it seemed like I was the only one who cared. Certainly the Army did not care. I didn't even find out that he was injured until he called me himself from a hospital in New Jersey. When the Army realized it had made a mistake and sent him to Fort Dix instead of Walter Reed, they transferred him days later. On September 23rd of 2004, Wendell was deployed on the Iraqi border in the 1178th Artillery out of the men in South Carolina. He had been a soldier with the National Guard for 16 years when he was activated for this deployment. About 10 months into his tour, he was hit in the head by a steel cargo door of an 18-wheeler while performing an inventory. The injuries, he, the injuries were serious enough that he had to be evacuated to Germany under heavy medication. And after a hospital mix-up I just mentioned, he was sent to Summer Hills Apartment com Complex, leased at Walter Reed. I took a leave from my job and went to see him in the capacity of a non-medical attendant with Army approval. This was in August of 2005. When I arrived to care for him, I found that he had no appointment scheduled with any Walter Reed staff. He had been assigned a social worker Aside from the evaluation he received after his injury, the Army had just left him in Summon Hills without any evaluation opportunities and therefore no treatment. I complained and had him transferred to the Malone House where he clearly could get some help. He had back and shoulder injuries and mental problems. After being admitted to the Malone House, he was tested for brain function and comprehension. 
I remember how medicated he was when they gave him the test. Later, the Army said the tests were inconclusive because he didn't try hard enough. <laughs> we waited for four months to get those results. He is a high school graduate. As I said before, he served in the National Guard for 16 and a half years. But the Army refuses to acknowledge that he suffered a brain injury. He freely told the Army that he was entitled one math and English student in grade school, meaning that he needed extra help with reading and math. But the Army has taken this information and used it against him. Over the months, we have listened in disbelief as the Army interpreted Title I Math and English to mean that he has a learning disability. He was considered fit enough to serve in the National Guard for 16 years. He was fit enough for deployment, but now they're saying his mental problems he had before he went to Iraq. In January of 2006, he was sent to a neurological care facility in Virginia for 10 weeks at my urging. Before he transferred, he received steroid shots in his back for his back injury. I was assured by the Army that this was the first of many treatments. But for 10 weeks while he was in Virginia, he didn't receive any more shots. Before leaving for Virginia, he was put on cholesterol medicine, which he had no trouble with before that require blood work every month to monitor his body's response. The required, the required, required blood work was never performed, and he developed an allergic reaction to the medication, which he sustained liver damage and gained 25 pounds during those three, 10 weeks. Back at Water Reed, a doctor ordered an MRI to check the condition of his shoulder, but the case manager refused to do the MRI. Her reason was that it would cost the Army too much money, and the only follow-up for Wendell's back injury was the decision of the Army that he suffers from degenerative disc disease, a pre-existing condition that they claim is unrelated to injuries overseas. On October 28, the Army and the National Guard retired him. He suffers from episodes of anxiety, forgetfulness, very bad mood swings. He walks with a cane and with a limp. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, American soldiers are injured every day in operations overseas. Every day, family members learn that their loved ones are coming home to them different than when they left. I am here for Wendell, but it, I am also here because family members should not have to go through this with a loved one that we have already been through. I thank you again for the opportunity to tell my story. Thank you, Mrs. McLeod. Uh, Specialist Jeremy Duncan has uh, opted not to give a statement so much as to respond to questions, and since we're moving on into the, uh, the question and answer period now and we'll be under the five-minute rule alternating from one side to the other, <laughs> I thought, Specialist Duncan, that I might start uh, just by asking you, uh, if you're willing to talk about it, could you tell us on this panel a little bit about uh, what chain of events led you to become a patient at Walter Reed? Uh, <clears throat> I myself was deployed in Iraq in Samara with the 101st, 3rd Brigade Rocket Science. Uh, doing patrol, uh, came across an IED, I got blown up, and uh, I came here and uh, since then, I've had no problems with medical care getting fixed from the problems I've had. What were the nature of your injuries? Uh, I had a uh, fractured my neck, uh, almost lost my left arm. I got titanium drawn, lost left ear, and lost sight and left eye. Now, I think many of us first uh, learned of your situation by reading the Washington Post and the description of the physical conditions of Building 18 and, and the area where you were staying. Could you tell us? on the record here today about those conditions in your room on Building 18? Uh, the conditions in the room, in my mind, were just, it was unforgivable for anybody to live, it, was, it wasn't fit for anybody to live in a room like that. I know most soldiers have, you know, just come out of recovery, you have weaker immune systems, the black mold can do damage to people, and the holes in the walls, I wouldn't live there even if I had to. It was, wasn't fit for anybody. What did you do to try to get the room fixed? Uh, I contacted the building manager and informed them that there was an issue with my room. They told me to put it in the system for a work order. I did that. It, a month went by. I asked him to do it again. He said put it back in the system. That went on two or three times. Uh, finally, I had my chain of command from Fort Campbell who came and visited me. They seen it. They made some phone calls to the person over here at Walter Reed. I don't know where it went, and they still never got fixed. That's when I contacted the Washington Post. And after the Washington Post article was published? I was immediately moved from that room, and the next day they were uh, renovating the room. Do you have any personal thoughts about other ways uh, 
that could be put in implemented to assist soldiers that are new to the facility here? As in uh, what perspective? And how to assist them in their services, the information, and, and getting that process working better than it apparently did for you? Uh, just uh, keep following, the ch keep following, and following through. And, uh, Keep bugging them about it. Let them know. Just keep letting them know until finally somebody gets sick of it and it finally gets done. Mr. McLeod, you, you had a situation of um, attempting at least to bring attention to Dell's uh, condition and situation. Would you share that with us? Uh, did you make known that you had some uh, issues with his treatment and care? To whom did you go and what were the results of that? I was very persistent. I went to his case manager. Um, she even got tired of dealing with me. I would. I went as far as the commanders. I went to the generals. Anybody that would listen to me, I would talk. Who was the commander here at, at that point in time? Was it uh, General Farmer? General Farmer, yes, sir. Did you go to General Farmer and express to him the difficulties? Yes, sir, I did. I was on his, uh, I was at his office door several days, and each time they turned me around. And how do you mean turn you around? And they told me he did not have time to talk to me. There was other situations present at the time also. Um, he knew of the situation, he knew of some of the conditions, and every, each time I went to him, they told me that he did not have time, he knew the situation, there was nothing he could do to help me. At some point in time, did you have a, a chance to meet with General Wheatman? I did. We were sitting in Burger King one day, and we were enjoying the day. He had a day of leave, and um, so we were sitting there, and General Wheatman walked up. Uh, in my recollection, he's a fine, honorable man. He had nothing to do with our situation. He was, in my perspective, being punished because he caught the tail end of it. Um, Mr. Waitman, in my opinion, he was just shoved into a situation that was already there. And because somebody had to be the fall guy, he was there. He's never done anything to me. He never knew about my situation. Uh, when I asked him questions, he was more than willing to give me answers that I needed. I have about a minute left here. We have a rather antiquated system on time watching over here because our lights aren't working. But, uh, Staff Sergeant, I want to ask you, I know that at some point you took matters into your own hands in trying to assist uh, people that were just coming new to the facility. Would you tell us a little bit about what you did and, and what caused you to take that action? Well, after the young service member died two doors down from me, uh, New Year's of 05, um, I... I had been looking at the system as it stood, and we were, we were having at that point up to 100 or over 200 personnel in one platoon run by one E7. <clears throat> That's uh, typically that type of level of authorities in charge of 30 to 40 personnel. And they had no E6s, my job, underneath them to help them keep accountability of those personnel. And at that point, I started asking my platoon sergeant at the time to give me 25% of the people in the platoon and help and then let me help track them because he they, they work long hours just trying to keep track of everyone. Um, uh, the primary problem with uh, the system, starting with the hospitals, it takes days for the paperwork to catch up with the medical holding company to let them know just that someone has gone outpatient to the Malone house. I had already been going to my ward on a daily basis to see who was coming and going. Um, when I asked for a squad leader position, they moved me over to work with a Sergeant First Class Alexander in the OIF OEF platoon at the time, an outstanding NCO, by the way. And we implemented a program and uh, eventually received 10 personnel to work underneath us that we checked every ward in the hospital every day, receiving uh, the uh, patient report from the Aero Medevac uh, office here in the hospital to let us know incoming out and outgoing personnel. Um, we would meet with incoming personnel, identify ourselves, give them business cards, let them know if they had any questions, they can contact us. We implemented a program to provide escort from the hospital over to the Malone House and the primary thing. Some go to other hospitals. We identified those that were staying here and going outpatient to the Malone House. When we identified them, then we were able to contact them in the Malone House and give them, a, uh, at, at that time, a proper in-processing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Shays. Thank you. The, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding these hearings, and thank you, our witnesses, for coming and testifying under oath. You met with us before, and you told us a number of stories that will be very helpful to this committee. I. Um, I want you, Sergeant uh, Shannon, to just describe one uh, example of the kind of attitude you encountered more often than you should have when you uh, came and asked for information five minutes before an office opened up. Do you remember that story? Yes. I have an anger problem. 
And uh, I think this is common across the board with the patients at the hospital. It's something these people are going to go through to some degree or another. And I'm, I forgive me. I've been told there's a time problem, and I'm talking quickly. You're but doing, you needn't talk quickly. You take your time. Okay. Um, in the course of the work I did at the hospital, I became very familiar with how things worked in the hospital. I became a person that would take a new soldier around and show them where they needed to go, who they needed to talk to. Because if I didn't have the answers at that point, I could send them in the direction they needed to go. And I'm just going to interrupt you. You described that that was quite common that the soldiers helped other soldiers because they yes. weren't getting the help from a caseworker or whomever. There, there just wasn't the staff for it at the time. The staff has increased significantly since that time. Okay. Um, but, but still, not enough staff. But at that point, I was showing a new soldier who was also a, a patient in ophthalmology down to the office. And it was five minutes before they opened, and I just needed to ask the lady if a certain neuro-ophthalmologist worked there. And she looked me up and down, in my opinion, like a piece of dirt, and said, come see me when we open. I, I won't repeat what I said to her. I cussed a blue streak and uh, took everything I had, not to jump, jump over the counter and smash the printer she was just using to copy You feel something. that that was more typical or an, an unusual kind of experience? The, the human nature indicates that in the course of any given day, in spite of your productivity, you'll have the easiest day you can have. Okay? What needs to not be forgotten here is that there's a human issue involved with these guys. And the problem, and I apologize, I talk a lot these days. It takes me all to get to the point. Um, there's, there, there's a hospital policy that regardless of ours, this is a written policy at this hospital, regardless of whether they're on the clock or not, they will always provide assistance to patients when they require it. I found that out because my wife worked here. That's the policy. You didn't feel it happened. Hell no. Okay. Let me ask you this. Almost all of you have said the help you received from the doctors when you received help was outstanding. Yes. Uh, would you agree, Sergeant? I mean, Specialist Duncan? Yes, sir. Um, Ms. McLeod, not, not, would you agree with that or would you? 50% yes. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. You got the sense that you were being pushed out of the active army, the military facilities, to the VA. Describe to me your attitude about that and why, what positions you took. Um, let me start with you, Specialist Duncan. You don't choose to leave the military. I'm not, I'm not leaving the military at all, sir. Okay, and just let me, this is something amazing to me. You, you told the military you, you had no intention of retiring. What was their reaction? Uh, they were kind of shocked. They were, at first, they were like, well, we don't think you can stay in because of the conditions I had. But like I said, some of the doctors here helped me find the, the, the actual regulations on my conditions, and I meet the requirements to stay in, so therefore I'm staying in. So the, you don't have an issue of getting help with the VA. So let me, uh, but first, thank you for wanting to stay in. Thank you for having to argue to stay in. Thank you for uh, your incredible service, all of you. And uh, Mr. McLeod, thank you, sir. But <coughs> let me have both of you, uh, Staff Sergeant, Ms. McLeod, tell me whether you would prefer to have VA help or have help <coughs> here. Why? Well, in our situation, the VA has absolutely been wonderful to him. But he was only referred to the VA because they refused him treatment here. Uh, my goal <clears throat> was to have him to receive his treatment because I felt that he would receive better treatment while he was on active duty because they stand first priority. Okay. Thank you. Let me, because I only have 30 seconds left. Uh, Sergeant Shannon? Um, I will receive care anywhere I can get it. But what are you waiting for right now? Describe to us what you're waiting for right now. I'm waiting for the plastic surgery to be done to uh, make my face capable of receiving a prosthetic eye. Um, and then they will start the procedure to start a prosthetic eye. They've given me the option to have the VA do it. I have a right to have it done before I'm retired. And as a workaholic, I'm not taking 30 days off from a job to have surgeries done. You told us your biggest concern. What's your biggest concern right now? My biggest concern? Yes, sir. My biggest concern is having the young men and women that have had their lives shattered in service to their country get taken care of. Thanks. That's my biggest concern. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chase. Mr. Waxman? <clears throat> Staff Sergeant Shannon, that's your biggest concern, and it's got to be the biggest concern of all Americans. I, I think that people are shocked when they heard about the Washington Post story of the deplorable conditions here at Walter Reed. 
And some of the reactions to those news reports have been, we never knew things were out of hand. Now, I can't understand that when we get officials who say they, they just didn't know things were happening that uh, were so shocking. Because I have, and I'm going to ask the chairman to make it part of the record, I have a long list, a uh, stack of reports and articles that sounded the alarm bells about what was going on here and around the country. For example, in February 2005, Mark Benjamin wrote an article in Salon magazine describing appalling conditions and shocking patterns of neglect in Ward 54, Walter Reitz's inpatient psychiatric ward. Another report from Salon in 2006 warned that soldiers with traumatic brain injuries were not being screened, identified, or treated, and others were being misdiagnosed, forced to wait for treatment, or called liars. And then we have, in June 2006, Military Times ran a story reporting on problems with the Physical Evaluation Board process. In 2005, Rand issued a very comprehensive report for the Secretary of Defense finding that the military disability system is unduly complex and confuses veterans and policymakers alike. And then the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, found inadequate collaboration between the Pentagon and the Veterans Administration to expedite vocational rehabilitation services for seriously injured service members. And GAO did some other reports as well. Because in February 2005, GAO reported on gaps in pay and benefits that create financial hardships for injured Army, National Guard, and Reserve soldiers. And in March 2006, GAO warned that a quarter of the active duty soldiers and more than half of reservists and guardsmen do not get their cases adjudicated according to Pentagon <laughs> guidelines. And in April 2006, GAO reported that military debts pose significant hardships to hundreds of sick and injured soldiers serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in May 2006, GAO issued a report on problems with the transition of care between, between the Pentagon and the Veterans Administration. And in fact, two weeks ago, the Army Inspector General revealed an ongoing investigation of problems with the physical evaluation board system, an investigation uh, which has already identified 87 problems with the medical evaluation system. Even Congress acted on this issue. The 2007 Defense Appropriations Bill called for physical evaluation board members to document medical evidence justifying disability ratings rather than simply allowing them to deny disabilities by writing pre-existing conditions, the kind of problem that your husband had, Mrs. McLeod. Despite all of these press reports, studies, and investigations, it took the Washington Post finally to capture people's attention, and they deserve an enormous amount of credit for what they've done. But despite all the work that went on before, top Pentagon officials reacted to the reports at Walter Reed two weeks ago by claiming surprise. Let me just read what the Pentagon's highest civilian official in charge of the military medical program said in a press conference. Dr. William Weckenwerder, Jr., the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, said, this news caught me, as it did many other people, completely by surprise. Well, my question for the three of you, or any of you who wants to respond, what's your reaction to these kinds of statements? What's your response to top military <coughs> officials when they claim they had no idea that there were any of these kinds of problems? Sergeant Shannon? Um, as you will read in my statement, I believe implicitly in an open-door policy. The biggest problem they have with me is I've been here long enough to see things constantly go up the chain. To be told, and I believe that is uh, General um, Waitman's primary mistake. I don't think he should have been fired, but he said he didn't know. That is not true in my opinion. 
Let me ask Mrs. McLeod, because I know I'm going to be running out of time. What's your reaction when you've been trying to get people's attention for the situation for your husband, and now when we have it so clearly laid out in the press and there's attention being paid to it, the, the higher-ups say that they were just su surprised to hear about all this. I have one question. Were they deaf? Because I worked the chain. I worked anybody that would listen. So they didn't, if you don't want to hear, you don't hear. Specialist Duncan? There's, there's no way they couldn't have known. I mean, everybody had to have known somewhere, just if they wanted to actually look at it or pay attention or believe it, it's up to them. There's another statement that I find even more offensive. On January 25, 2005, David Chu, the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, was asked by the Wall Street Journal about the costs of military health insurance and pensions. In response, he stated, quote, the amounts have gotten to the point where they are hurtful. They are taking away from the nation's ability to defend itself, end quote. What's your view of this statement? Do you believe honoring our service members by ensuring they are properly cared for lessens our nation's ability to defend itself? Absolutely not. The cost of care for veterans should not come out of monies that are designated to fight a war. The cost of care for veterans that are wounded in the course of that fighting the war should come out of separate funds. If, if a certain amount of money is designated, I mean, I don't work at that level, but a certain amount of money is designated to fight a war, it needs to focus on the war. And there needs to be separate funds set aside. Because when it comes, if, if they're going to indicate they don't have the funds to do it, well, they need to uh, separate, break the issue down. You can't take away from what the soldiers need over there. You can't take away from the soldiers need over here. And you can't combine the cost because it's too much. Under Secretary Guerin welcomed us this morning by saying that there's a, an old ar Army military tradition that you leave no wounded soldier behind. Ooh, uh, this sounds to me like this particular man was saying that it's more important to fight, even if it means leaving some of our wounded brave men and women and patriots <clears throat> behind in their health care or their disability. I, I'm very disturbed by what we're hearing, and I'm glad that uh, Chairman Tierney has convened this hearing right here at uh, Walter Reed. And from what we're hearing, what's going on here in Walter Reed may be the tip of the iceberg of what's going on all around the country. People are flooding us with complaints that it's not just Walter Reed. Check out what's going on all around the country. And right now in Los Angeles, the Veterans Administration wants to privatize the land rather than take care of the returnees and the veterans. Thank, thank you, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Davis. Well, thank you. And let me thank Mr. Waxman. As you know, we, a number of those GAO reports this committee requested, some of them coming from complaints from veterans uh, that were stationed right here. Ms. McLeod, let me, let me start with you. You went up the chain many times, didn't you? Yes, sir. You finally called this committee. You were so uh, upset. Uh, Sir, I would talk to anybody that would listen, and it took the aid of another soldier who actually heard me cry, saw me cry one day, and he says, this is a number, make a call. And that's when I called Miss Washburn, and then you know my story because you've dealt with me. Had I not had any other recourse, I wouldn't be here today. The thing of the matter is, Mr. Harvey made a statement the other day that really bothers me. He said that he hoped the Washington Post was satisfied because they ruined careers. First, let me come on record by saying I don't care about your career as far as anybody that is in danger. That doesn't bother me. All I'm trying to do is have my life, the life that I had and that I know. My life was ripped apart the day that my husband was injured. But then having to live through the mess that we lived through at Water Reed has been worse than anything I've ever sacrificed in my life. Thank you. I was referring to Grace Washburn of our staff who's to help us and take taking the lead in this when people weren't getting paid right, then they sick the bill collectors on them. People afraid of losing their houses when they come back languishing. It's uh, if they didn't have any warnings of this, they weren't paying attention. Because as Mr. Waxman noted, we had a number of GAO reports that we authorized. GAO calls the balls and strikes for Congress, showing that this was a systematic uh, problem. Now, I understand that Walter Reed holds town hall meetings.
Could each of you tell us about these, who runs these meetings, who attends them, how they are advertised, how often they take place, what types of issues are discussed, uh, and do problems get resolved? When uh, I first got here, the wives at the Malone House had started meeting on Thursdays to have a wives' meeting to get issues addressed. That started doing some good. Uh, I've been here a long time. The PTSD issues started kicking in. They started having me stay at home. I've never been to a town hall meeting. I had an opportunity just before the Dana Priest story to come out to, to go to a sensing session for NCOs and uh, any service members. And uh, I couldn't see the point in it. I've been here too long. I don't know what, it, it just hasn't done any good. So I didn't go. Have either of you, any of you been to town? Either? I was the first wife that actually spoke up. I was the one that actually stated my piece um, because they had denied him treatment. They sent him to Virginia for 10 weeks for the brain injury and I looked him, I looked Colonel Hamilton in the face and I told him, I said, y'all must have thought y'all cured him because you hadn't touched him since he's been back. My thing is, he opened the floor and I blasted him with everything I had because I was to the point I really didn't care because it seemed like I had had enough. I was tired of fighting the system. I was tired of trying to help him get well. At the same time, they didn't seem to really care. They wanted him out of here. They wanted to turn him over to the VA. His case manager at the time was Captain Regina Long. She got tired of dealing with me when he was in Virginia because I started calling him three weeks, calling her three weeks before he come back from Virginia, letting her know that what he needed, what he didn't need, what he needed to follow up on. And she got so aggravated with me because there was a span that I had gone home to try to get things together there. She actually sent him home to keep from having to deal with him. She told me, she said, I cannot maintain him the way you want to maintain him. She said, so you, I'm going to send him home until we can decide what to do with him and we'll probably turn him over to the VA. I fought tooth and nail, and that's an old saying for me because the, he should have been taken care of. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I'll just ask Mr. Duncan one to respond to that. Sure. I've never actually been in 10 home meeting myself, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Lynch from Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Chairman Tierney and Chairman Waxman and also Ranking Member Shays and uh, Davis for holding this hearing. I want to thank the panelists for your willingness to, to testify and to help this committee with its work. And you really are speaking this morning not only for yourselves but everyone else in uniform. Uh, a lot of the members up here have been over to Iraq a number of times. I've been, I've been over five times and, and also Afghanistan. And I know the a lot of these members have gone with me. And one of the things that always struck me, uh, whether we were in at the, uh, at the launch stool uh, medical facility in Ramstein or whether we were in Balad uh, visiting very severe, severely wounded uh, young men and women in uniform, they always <clears throat> talked about, well, it's going to be okay once I get to, to Walter Reed. And uh, it was just this... This gold standard and this confidence and trust in our, our military personnel that when they got to Walter Reed, it was going to be okay. They were going to get put back together and, and they were going to have a maximum outcome, whatever their, their injuries were. And uh, I, I think these most recent revelations have been a, well, it's been a real blow to that, to that reputation. And so the task here for us and, and together with your help and, and I thank all the members of the military who are here today, and I appreciate their service to our country. Our job today is to, to make this right. It's not just about doing the right thing. It's, a, it's about doing the thing right and making sure that, that this process works. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, was stunning to me in, in going through all the testimony and uh, previous hearings with the uh, veterans groups is that uh, for, for, for Disability approval uh, within within the armed services. I noticed that uh, the Marine Corps, well, it's actually the Navy, but the Marine Corps approves about 30% uh, 
35% of its injured uh, for temporary or permanent disability. And the airport, the Air Force approves about 24%. Now, but the Army that, that uh, had the largest number of active duty soldiers and reservists uh, put less than 4%. It's a massive difference, and it, it can't be it can't be just random. Uh, and I and I know each of you uh, went through this process and 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 also witnessed your uh, fellow in arms uh, together going through this process, and you saw how this was handled. I know the PTSD issue is out there, and and that we saw. Uh, less willingness on the part of the military to approve disability based on PTSD. What do you do? You see a, a purposeful effort here to refuse uh, the 30 percent disability that would 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 bring, I think, dignity and and uh, the right benefits to to those who are are injured in, in uniform. Uh, I'd like to to just get your sense of it. Whether this is a a uh, purposeful attempt. Uh, to deny those benefits to men and women in uniform? We were fortunate because I didn't give up. They had no intention of even compensating him for the cognitive dysfunction. Only when we started the med board, they had already done all of his addendums and sent them in. They tested him for his brain injury after, with the help of Mr. Davis and Ms. Grace Washburn, we, they did a congressional investigation and they called me in the office and they, all the colonels, all the case managers, nurse case manager, my husband's platoon sergeant, commander of the med holdover, what can we do to make this right? I said exactly what you should have done to start with. You know, here's a man, his life's messed up, but you not only messed his life up, you messed mine too. Give us what we need rightfully and let me go home. They tested him the very next day because when they first tested him, they said he didn't try hard enough. He went from being in Title I math and reading to six months down the line, he was in special <coughs> education, according to the Army. He never was in special education. He's, before he was injured, he was as smart as most people are. Um, most children have trouble when they're coming up. I had trouble in math, but believe me, I'm far from being mentally retarded. When the Army through, was through with him, they had him down to where he was mentally retarded, and that was on black and white. So they retested him, and they come up to me a week later, and they told me, Miss McLeod, we did find something. We found that he was slow. We found that his cognitive skills don't measure up. Well, you would have found them to start with if you'd have paid attention. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cloud. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you and the ranking member uh, holding this hearing. I believe that as a nation, we certainly have no greater, greater duty and responsibility than caring for those who defend our freedoms. And uh, it's a privilege to hear the testimony of our Staff Sergeant Shannon, uh, Specialist Duncan, Mr. McLeod, uh, we appreciate your courage and service on the home front, uh, the Staff Sergeant Specialist, and <coughs> Mr. McLeod, your courage and service on the uh, on the home front and theirs on the war front. Um, I want to start, uh, Staff Sergeant Shannon, you talk about your specific case and, and make sure I understand the circumstances of when you were first injured, two days later, um, here at Water Reed, um, from, uh, November um, 13th, and you arrived here, um, or three days, November 16th. First of all, I don't remember the exact date. Okay. I was wounded November 13th, and I know I spent two or three days in Lance Tool, but I really don't remember. Um, Is it safe to say within a week you've been transferred here and then discharged to outpatient? I, I'm pretty sure I was discharged on the 18th, okay. which is about three days or five days after That's I was right. shot. So sir. five days after being wounded in Iraq, um, severe injuries, uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, you were discharged outpatient, basically given a map of where to go and, and left to, to be on your own. Is that correct? Yes, sir, and some of that's my fault. I'm a staff sergeant. I won't stay in bed. Somebody else can have it. Whether I need to be there or not is something I'm qualified to say. I just won't stay in an area. <laughs> well, 
Well, we, we appreciate that can-do approach and, and wanting to look out for others, but it just is amazing that basically cut loose uh, to that outpatient and without some guidance. You talked about finally getting in touch with your case manager, and then uh, your case manager did assist in setting up some appointments. Once you made that contact, what was the give and take between you and your case manager? Did, did he regularly get in touch with you? Or was it always you having to pursue them? The, the problem was directly related to the breakdown of the system. Uh, actually, my case manager was a lady named uh, Maggie Hardy. She's a wonderful case manager. And after I had finally made contact with her, um, she, first of all, was, was, uh, was wondering where I had been, and yet knowing I hadn't been AWOL because they were tracking my systems in the computer, uh, my appointment. I was making my appointments in the computer system. But after I met her, and that became part of my counseling for incoming personnel, know who your case manager is and, and work with them because they'll keep things happening that need to be happening. Does that answer the question? So the, the contact, once you established it, then there, there was a, a, a good back and forth between you and her. Yes, sir. The, um, the gentleman you mentioned, uh, uh, Danny Soto, uh, an independent, um, how did you come to be in touch with him and, and uh, what's his official role at the, uh, at the Malone House? Um, I've met Danny Soto a number of different times. Um, I'm not sure who he works for. Actually, I think it might be Wounded Warrior. Um, uh, I'm sorry. DAV. DA, DAV. Okay. Um, but I know that uh, many personnel at the hospital or at the Malone House in the system can speak to the work that he does as an advocate for them in the MEB PEB process for return to duty, medical discharge, or medical retirement. He's he, he's but like I said, he's just one man. Uh, there, there needs to be an entire staff of people that work outside of a government connection that have knowledge of how the system is supposed to work. Um, and can give us guidance in that system because a, a huge problem, regardless of what is done here, is to re-earn the trust of the patients here. And I spoke to some of the officers that are, are, that are working on it. They can fix the problem, and I know myself, I don't trust it. They have to figure out some way to get me to trust it again. So uh, Danny uh, Soto would serve as a good example of the type of ombudsman that you think would be wise for those wounded in the families? Absolutely, sir. He's priceless. Um, question, and, and Mr. McLeod, in, uh, in the prior two terms, I chair the Subcommittee on Financial Management, and we saw significant difficulties with the Army on the financial side of dealing with Guard and Reservists. And, and I understand your husband was a Guardsman and then active, uh, activated? Yes, sir. Right? Um, did you feel that it was a different treatment because of having been a guardsman at family as opposed to active duty, or you think it was more across the board regardless of active duty, reserve, guards, uh, guardsmen? As far as the finance, um, we didn't have any trouble with the finance as far as the issues. We did have a soldier that befriended my husband and stole his identity. That kind of finance I had trouble with. Jeez. But um, other than finance issues with the Army. I but but the medical issues, uh, such as you, you referenced the case manager denying the MRI, even though the doctor ordered right. it, those type of medical issues, do you think, did you see a difference? And, and, and Staff Sergeant Shannon, maybe you can uh, answer this too, is as how active duty soldiers, was there a difference in how they received care and follow up versus guard and reserve? Did that create a problem because of the, the challenge of, of managing a, a very large deployment of guard and reserve? Well, first of all, I apologize, my, um, uh, That's all right. Take your time. When I was first here, the medical hold company was all services combined. Okay. Now they have two companies, the medical holdover and medical hold. That was very necessary. But watching them try to go through an additional paperwork process was uh, there was no question in my mind that the indicators, I, I say things like that because I'm a reconnaissance type, but the indicators were, were such that um, they were having a lot more trouble figuring out the paper trail that is correct for the services they need um, and the connections they needed with their states in, ver in, in reference to those services. Mm -hmm. I think my, my time's up. Time I just want to thank you for your service and taking a personal struggles that each of you have had in turning them into public good through your testimony here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Just for the benefit of the members, to let them know the next uh, speakers will be Mr. Yarmouth, Mr. Duncan, Mr. Braley, Mr. Turner. And on from there, so Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thanks to all three of you for being here today. And, and I would like to add my voice to what I'm sure are millions of American voices who are not only very sorry for the ordeal you've gone through, but also are very angry about it. 
Um, I'm glad we had this hearing, and, and I know that eventually we are going to correct the problems that resulted in, in your situations. I would also like to say one thing as a former journalist, that it is precisely this type of situation for which the First Amendment was uh, conceived. And I salute the Washington Post, Newsweek, Bob Woodruff, and all those who brought this situation to light. Uh, I'm also astounded that it took so long to come to light. Um, these uh, situations apparently are longstanding. And I'm curious as to know, and this would be for uh, Staff Sergeant Shannon and Specialist Duncan, what the normal procedure would be for you to raise complaints about the treatment you were getting? Open door policy, sir. Um, open door policy works well as long, uh, well, and if people don't understand the policy, if you have a concern, a lower level soldier, it takes it to me. If I don't satisfy that concern for him, he has a right to take it above my head. And he can continue up to the chain until his concern is addressed. And. First of all, the Washington Post didn't come to speak to me. They came to speak to my wife. She's a person that everyone knows, knows problems that go on here. In the course of that, they met me, and I decided to exercise what, in my opinion, was the necessary open-door policy for the problems here. It's called public opinion. Because when a command uses, in my opinion, the open-door policy to keep problems in-house, which is the correct method, but not to solve those problems, which is an incorrect method, then you, there's got to be a level it can go to that the problem can be fixed. And my, my personal understanding of those problems going very high indicated that nobody was going to fix this. And I'm a leader. My wife reminds me I'm a patient. Those kids, no offense to the service members, are going to get taken care of, period. I feel basically the same way. I mean, you address it as high as you can until finally you get fed up with it and just do what you have to do to get it done. I'm curious as to why, however, in this particular case, nobody along the chain of command reacted at all, apparently, to do anything about it, since you, you all had to go outside the system. Uh, what is it about the mentality there? What, did everyone feel complicit in this? Um, helpless. I'm curious as to why no one in the chain of command would have responded. I guess their idea is they probably, as, as they already said, is we didn't know this was happening like this. We didn't have any ideas. And correct me if I'm wrong, Sergeant. Sir, <laughs> I feel the need to say this. They did respond. And as I s read my statement, of course, but the response was indicative of a broken system that's trying to survive. They fired a good man. They fired a few of them. Some of them may have deserved it. But I've got to say, First Sergeant Walker, the First Sergeant of Medical Holding Company, is someone I've known for a while and has gone to bat for us on a daily basis. I, I would just personally like to apologize to him. He's a good man, and he didn't deserve it. I don't think. Now, I'm not privy, and I don't have a right to know the ins and outs of his case. But a system that fires people down the chain... Once again, in my opinion, it is indicative of a system that is trying to protect itself, whether it fixes the problem or not, and in my opinion, clearly not focused on fixing the problem. About a year ago, I had a situation which I was on a plane talking to a man who just come back from Washington and had visited Walter Reed with a friend of his, and they were talking to a soldier who was from Lexington, Kentucky, had been, in the postal, uh, been a postal worker, uh, was in the guard, was wounded, and so forth. It was near Christmas time. His <laughs> life had been disrupted, his financial stresses and all those things that, that we're well aware of now. And he had, uh, well, this man whom, to whom I was speaking had asked him if there was anything he could do for his family or for him, him for Christmas to make his life easier, and he said, that, yeah, he said, I'd like some clean T-shirts because it's very cold where I am, and they can't afford to give me clean T-shirts. And it, I kind of forgot about it at the time because you hear about Walter Reed and the, the extraordinary care that's provided here, and I thought it was kind of an aberration. I'm wondering how trivial and how many of these situations exist. We've heard of, in the Post series and others, some, some of the more heinous situations with patients being lost and obviously the, the deaths that have occurred and so forth. But at what level does this stop? Well, the gentleman's time has expired. Perhaps Sorry, one, uh, one brief answer will suffice. 
I can't speak to levels, but when I gotta, you know, get my purple heart in civilian clothing and uh, give show my purple heart to supply just so I can get my my uniform, it's, it's broken. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and I join the others in uh, thanking you for calling uh, this hearing. And I want to also thank uh, uh, former Chairman Davis for the great work that he did in this regard, trying to at least uh, start doing something uh, about this. Uh, let me uh, let me say first of all, though, that uh, whenever any government agency uh, seems to uh, screw up in some big way, the the two things they always say they always say that their uh, uh, computers and technology wasn't good enough or wasn't up to date, which uh, they have far better technology throughout the federal government than most uh, major private businesses. But secondly, and most often, we hear the, th the claim that uh, they're underfunded. I think uh, we need to point out that uh, both the uh, uh, Defense Department and, and the VA, but particularly the Defense Department, have received massive increases in funding in the last five or ten years, mega billions. And so this is clearly not a shortage or problem of money. Uh, we, uh, the Congress has given huge increases uh, to the Defense Department in recent years, and we have tried to say many times that we want uh, uh, plenty of money going for um, uh, this medical care. As uh, I join all the others in saying this should be the highest priority, and I want to also join others in thanking each of you for coming forward. But, uh, Ms. McLeod, I noticed that you said uh, you thought General Waitman might be a fall guy, and, and then uh, uh, Sergeant Shannon, you seem to be less critical of him also. I believe he just came in August. But um, in, the, in one of the Washington Post stories, it says Cong Congressman Bill Young and his wife stopped visiting the wounded at Walter Reed, which they were doing, I think, on a weekly basis. Uh, out of frustration. Young said he voiced concerns to commanders over troubling incidents he witnessed that were, was rebuffed or ignored. When Bev and I would bring uh, problems to the attention of authorities of Walter Reed, we were made to feel very uncomfortable. Beverly Young said she complained to Kylie several times. She once visited a soldier who was lying in urine on his mattress pad in the hospital. When a nurse ignored her, Young said, I went flying down to Kevin Kiley's office again and got nowhere. He has skirted this stuff for five years and blamed everyone else. Did, did you find that to be true, that to everybody was blaming somebody else with the problems that, that you had? I'll, I'll ask each of you. I feel that everybody's passing the book. You go to one, they say, well, it's not my problem. You need to go to so-and-so. I did everything but camp out. I mean, honestly, and if I could got away with that, I probably would have done that too. You can't keep looking and not getting answers. Sergeant like, Shannon? It's difficult for me to speak about people passing the buck. It's 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 something that has surprised me in, in by virtue of this story coming out in the post. I just want to see the problem get fixed. I work at my level. I'm good at working at my level. Um, I know that on a constant basis, things were passed to hire. Well, let me ask you this. The sub-headlines in the, ma the main Washington Post story said uh, bureaucratic bungling and it said frustration at every turn. Do you think those are accurate descriptions of what Absolutely. you ran into? The bottom line is like a situation I know of. A young man misses entire, missing his entire right arm that the Army has seen, to fit, um, seen fit to award 10 percent disability because he's going to receive 80 percent of the use of his arm with his prosthetic. Oh yes. That's the bottom line, uh, sir. One of these stories says General Kiley lives right across the street from Building 18, which is apparently the worst uh, uh, example of what's going on here. Did, did any of the three of you, did you see these uh, top generals and, and the top brass here getting out and, and going around and observing what was going on, or did, uh, do you feel like they stayed isolated in their offices and just meeting with uh, their staff people? After the article came out, there was a lot of people visiting Building 18 and looking into it. it was after the article came out. Before then, it was occasionally a commander would come through, check on everybody, make sure everything's going right. It wasn't like overwhelmed as it is now, but before it was just, you know, a few people going in and check on and everybody said, hey, everybody's doing. Oh. Well, that's, that's what I was talking about was before the articles came out. Let, let me just, uh, I know my time is about to run out, but let me say this. Uh, uh, it's not just members of Congress up here who are upset about this. It, I'll tell you, it's people all over the whole country, and they are very upset about this. 
And uh, I think uh, all of us are going to demand that action be taken. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. <coughs> Mr. Braley. Staff Sh Sergeant Shannon, Mrs. McLeod, and Specialist Duncan, thank you for your courage in coming here today and sharing your stories with us. I'm here because my brother, Brian, works as a kinesiotherapist at the VA hospital in Knoxville, Iowa, taking care of patients every day. And I know that every member who provides medical and psychiatric care to veterans is tainted by the stories we're talking about here today. Every person in the VA system should want these problems solved so that we get back to having pride in the facilities that take care of our veterans. One of the things that I'm not at all shocked about is the fact that um, case managers may be playing a role in denying access to veterans to the benefits that they're entitled to. Because I'm familiar with the AMA guides to permanent evaluation. I'm familiar with the DSM-4 criteria that are used. And I've represented veterans and their families in life and disability claims. And one of the things that's been known for a long time is that case managers have two functions. One is to return a worker to the workforce as quickly as possible, and two, to minimize the cost to the employer of returning them to work. Those don't work at the same level of advocacy that patients need. And what I'd like to know, is there anybody who serves the role as a ombudsman or as a patient advocate here at Walter Reed in assisting patients with these claims? My first experience with that, and I apologize, mm -hmm. I talk too much, but <laughs> my first experience with that was working with my initial uh, Pebble counselor. And uh, he, he gave me all the information about, hey, you need to educate yourself about this process because once this is done, it's done. And if you miss something you're entitled to, it's gone. And so based on his knowledge of the system, I said, okay, well, tell me what I need to do or tell me who to talk to. And he just had to smile at me and say, I don't know who, to, who you should talk to. They're all retired and gone. At that point, I was no longer able to trust my Pueblo counselor in the process. Danny Soto, once again, is a person outside of the system who is knowledgeable of the system is someone that we can trust because based on what I consider an automatic conflict of interest, the PEBLO and the MEBPEB process both work for the same organization, United States government. Mrs. McLeod, one of the reasons I'm concerned about what we're hearing today from you is that part of the response to the problems here at Walter Reed was to propose adding 39 additional case managers to assist with the processing of these disability claims. And to me, what we're talking about as a solution to the problems that you and others have shared is making sure that there are people outside the case managers who are here to assist veterans and their families negotiate the difficult process of qualifying for and receiving an official determination of whether or not they're entitled to disability benefits. Would you care to comment on that? My thing is, if the doctor feels necessary to run a test, it's not the case manager's job to second guess that. If it were, she would be in the doctor's place. I went to my husband's case manager. I begged her when on April 19th he was supposed to have set up the MRI to have it scheduled. He got that MRI June 23rd when I took him myself. The case managers need to stop playing doctor and they need to be case managers. They're supposed to get them where they need to go, schedule the appointments, and stop questioning it. But instead, his case manager, Captain Regina along, got so upset at me, she sent him home to keep from having to deal with him. Now, but she thought quick enough whenever I put in the resources that I did, she gave him a physical in her office. Now, we're talking sanitary. Have you seen those offices? The last thing you want to be doing is examining the office. Uh, I won't tell you how mad I got, and I won't tell you the things that I said. But the treatment that she gave him before I had her fired as his case manager, a dog wouldn't have deserved. Do the three of you know, does the JAG Corps provide any type of legal assistance to veterans who are processing disability claims? 
I don't know about processing disability plan claims, but the JAG has been very helpful here just in the course of my wife's vehicle being repossessed. Uh, the vehicle that I owned prior to going to combat and my, my not knowing, I couldn't remember who to send payments to and stuff after I was wounded, um, contacting those companies and, and, and getting the message across that we've been wounded and give them some time to, to catch up. So I'm not sure about processing claims, but they're there and they, and they have done good work for me. I've, the only time I dealt with the JAG was during the episode where the guy tapped into all our accounts when he stole my husband's identity and they told me that it was not an issue for them then I had to go through finance. Well, thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and uh, of course Ranking Member uh, Davis for your efforts in trying to ensure that we have quality medical care and the, the services uh, that, that we need for our, our men and women who have served their country. Uh, Staff Sergeant Shannon, Mrs. McLeod, Specialist Duncan, I, I want to personally thank you for uh, your service and what you have done, uh, not just uh, in trying to ensure that there's appropriate care here, but in making certain that the word is known uh, as to what needs to be done. Uh, you've got a great deal of courage and you have, um, have uh, certainly uh, brought things to light that have saddened many people across the country. I know that you're aware uh, that uh, on the next panel uh, and then the third panel that uh, we have people who are going to, to come and, and speak about this issue who have uh, various degrees of accountability or various degrees of answers. Uh, we have General Kyle Kiley, uh, General Waitman, um, we have General <coughs> Shoemaker and General uh, Cody. Cody um, what kind of, um, what would you like to hear from them and what type of questions would you like to hear them answer um, with the issues that you've brought forward? On their level at this point, this is about accountability. Um, like I said, you know, I'm a firm believer in the Peter principle. Don't ask me to work in a job I'm not qualified to do. This has no reflection on whether they're qualified to do it, but it reflects directly on my ability to speak to what they should do. Um, I just want them to fix the problem. In fact, I, I, I personally got a little angry when Harvey resigned. Now, I don't know how things work in Washington, D.C., but in combat, we don't get to resign when bullets are flying and people are dying. Now, the way that reflects on this issue is that this is a political war, to some degree, on a daily basis. And when they're receiving political incoming rounds in the course of helping us or in the course of dereliction of duty in that requirement, they continue to fight for us until they're fired pull themselves up by their bootstraps, like any sergeant would do, admit to their mistakes, and work to fix them until they're fired. Mrs. McLeod? On my level, as far as the family members are concerned, I like them to answer to the family, to say, we can guarantee, and that's what I want, I want a guarantee, that not anybody would have to go through what I went through. That we're gonna listen, and we're going to take charge. To me, uh, I like to hear them actually say they're going to fix the problem, not just cover up what they're trying to do, make it you know, sound like, hey, yeah, we're fixing Building 18. All it is is paint and spackle. Like, that doesn't fix. It just covers up. Just fix it like they're trying to do now. They just need to fix it from the ground up. Get it fixed so it's fit to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Uh, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this meeting. I'd like to thank uh, the people who are testifying. I'd like to thank all those who served our country. We need to show our thanks. We need to show it through respect and the way we welcome our veterans and their families home. And we're not doing a very good job, and that's why we're having this hearing today. I first became aware that the system uh, at the VA level had challenges and was broken by being the daughter of a disabled veteran and watching benefits erode away. Talking to veterans in my community about long waits, lack of equipment. They knew when they saw the overworked staff, however, they were going to get the best of care, but it was having the ability to see the staff. I'm uh, very uh, 
very concerned about a lot of issues, but I want to follow up on one. And if you don't mind, uh, Staff Sergeant, I'm going to quote from your full testimony. Quote, I've been lost in the system. I want to leave this place. I've seen so many soldiers get so frustrated with the process they will sign anything presented just so that they can get on with their lives. By signing documentation without fighting for the benefits they've earned, they're agreeing in writing to the Army's determination of their benefits. And as Mr. Lynch pointed out, the Army's only at 4 percent in determining benefits. We almost have no advocacy in working for, working, you know, that's not working for the government. No one that we can talk to about this process, no one who's knowledgeable and that we can trust who is going to give us fair treatment and informed guidance. The physical evaluation counselors, the MEP and the, PE, and, the, and the PEB both work for the government and have its interests at heart, not ours. Mr. Lynch had been quoting from um, a document that he had. And I'd like to um, add a little more to what uh, Staff Sergeant just uh, said in his own words and then ask a question. Each branch of the military provides for opportunities for injured and uh, service members to challenge their ratings. Most of the injured simply pocket their severance checks and go home. Only 20 percent of the soldiers ask for formal hearings at which an attorney can uh, present evidence and call witnesses. As the Army says, only half of those soldiers proceed with hearings. Perhaps that indicates most injured soldiers are satisfied with their ratings. But veterans groups say more wounded service members would challenge their ratings if it wasn't so complicated and time consuming. Most of those hurt in the line of duty are young weary of fighting and anxious to return home to their, sever uh, to their civilian lives. And in other words, and these are my own words, a severance check can look really quick and a lot less painful at times, not realizing the benefits that they have been signing away. I would ask you to um, uh, tell us if you know of any uh, pressures that you, that you have either heard of or witnessed for people to sign away their benefits and uh, what uh, we need to do in order to make sure that veterans know, either by providing an ombudsperson or whatever, that their rights will be protected. We do welcome them home, and we do respect them. I'll try that one. I know a soldier, fairly young, maybe early 20s, was deployed. I took this soldier under my wing whenever we met, and he was a great guy, very nice. He told his recruiter that he had an episode in high school, and the Army took him anyway. They <laughs> sent him to Iraq. When he got back to Water Reed, they diagnosed him with bipolar, but he was pre-existing. The Army gave him zero percent. This guy has nothing. He's trying to find his way back into society. It may never be what he was, mm -hmm. but they gave him zero percent. This is how we treat our soldiers. We give them nothing, but they're good enough to go and sacrifice their life, and we give them nothing. You need to fix the system. Compensate where it's needed. This soldier needs care. Yeah, the VA will treat him, but the VA will treat him according to his rating mm -hmm. with the Army because it's the first thing they ask. What was your rating with the Army? You get a category. We were fortunate because my fight still continues. They knew me first name basis. But what about the ones that don't have me? What about the ones that don't have a wife? Our mother or father can stand up for. If you're good enough to go, you're good enough to be taken care of when you leave here. We need to take care of those that took care of us. Thank you, Ms. McCullough. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> and I want to thank all of the folks who are here today and all of our military people who are here for being willing to serve to um, protect our rights to be here. I'm very interested in the issue of accountability. And um, I realize that throughout our society, we have 
people who are unresponsive. We, we see it every day in the personnel in the Congress. I will tell you that there are people who work throughout government agencies who don't always react the way they should react, particularly to other staff people. What I'm interested in is how do we fix the system? Uh, casting blame doesn't do us any good if we aren't fixing the system. Um, Sergeant Shannon, um, Ms. McLeod, uh, Specialist Duncan, do you have some specific recommendations to make? And you don't have to tell them to us today. But do you have some specific recommendations that you can make on how the system can be better so that it's fixed? And I'm particularly interested in how do we assign responsibility in order to have accountability. It seems to me that the com biggest complaint you all have made is this passing the buck complaint. So how can we establish a system that says you've been to someone, you've asked a question, it is in your mind the responsibility of that person to take care of that problem and they don't do it. Unless we're willing to fire people who are either incompetent or um, unresponsive, then what alternatives do we have to trying to solve that, the problems that we're seeing? I believe I can speak directly to that based on the military system I've grown to know so well myself. Any non-commissioned officer can tell you that you don't just give people instructions to do things, you supervise them. Okay? A person can be getting close to a position where they need to be fired. However, with proper supervision, they can be brought back in line. This directly relates to priorities, in my opinion. And the breaking of the story has changed priorities, and now things are getting done. The priorities of the people above that need to be supervising what is done below them on a daily basis can be changed so that they are not super supervising at the level they need to be supervising at. If I was doing that at my level, I'd be in danger of getting fired in my job. Um, like any system, whether it be it's civilian or military, at the point you see someone that's having a problem doing their job correctly, you counsel them. And if they still can't do it, you counsel them again. I believe it's three times, then they're fired. But that requires proper supervision, ma'am. If supervision is not happening, you know, how can you counsel somebody you're really not watching what they're doing? The others? In my situation, for example, my husband went to a doctor. The doctor roughed him up pretty good. Finally, I wound up having to take him to the emergency room because he couldn't move for three days. We filed a complaint. When the patient rep called me, first she wouldn't talk to me, and then my husband said, you need to talk to my wife. She can explain to you more. I told her what happened. And she asked me, she says, are you sure? I said, yeah, I wouldn't have filed the complaint if it hadn't have been sure. She says, well, I'm sorry on behalf of the hospital, but sometimes things like this happen. No, it doesn't happen. When they tell you that's all they can do, that's all they can do. We have doctors, let me specify, he has doctors that were so eager to fight for the system, they made him able to move. They put him in the emergency room, but they made him able to move because they wanted to fight for the Army. We need to turn around. We need to fight for the soldier. <coughs> the soldier's the reason you have a job. When they go to the case manager, they shouldn't be second guessing. They should say, okay, we'll put you where you need to be. We'll get the doctor. When you go to the doctor and he says, okay, we need to do this, you have to go back to the case manager. She has to set up everything. There shouldn't be, well, I'll talk to the doctor. No problem. This needs to be taken care of. You need to start treating the soldiers like citizens, like the same representative anybody would want. <clears throat> you go to your doctor, you don't want him to second guess you. You want him to find a problem. You want him to get a result. That's what you go to him for. That's exactly the same thing they need to do. They need to start at the very bottom first and find out why they can't do their job to the capacity they need to do. You need to work your way up the system. When you find the broken link, you either put some glue on it and fix it or you get rid of it. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each one of the witnesses for your outstanding testimony. If there are this many problems in Building 18, how about Buildings 1 through 17 or buildings with higher numbers? We need to make sure that we are getting to all the problems here at Walter Reed. Are there any other facilities or personnel issues that we need to know about? Uh, from my understanding, I just got currently moved over to Building 14 myself uh, as of Friday. Our complaint for people living in 18 didn't want to move because over in Building uh, 18 we had free cable and there was computers downstairs. From my understanding now, they're moving TVs and computers over to Building 14. How long that's going to take, I'm not sure. But they're just trying to make it better now from the issues we've had before. And everybody's com everybody was comparing uh, Building 14 with 18. There's no comparison. Building 18, honestly, I hate to say it was like ghetto. It was tore up. It had nothing. But it had the stuff that we like to have. Building 14 was luxury, but didn't have the same things we had over in 18, which now they're fixing. So in my opinion, they're starting to make it look better. So everything's turning back towards the Malone House. The Malone House was like, if you've been in the Malone House and you moved out, you hated it. But you lived in the Malone House, you were living the life. It was great. You had a kitchen downstairs, had food and everything, ready to go. So, I mean, they're trying to make it better. I will give them that. But, you know, it's going to take a while for them to do that. The uh, U.S. government, under the so-called BRAC round, has scheduled the closure of all of Walter Reed in a few years and to move everything over to the Bethesda campus. What opinion, if any, do you have about that shutdown of this entire facility and move over to the Bethesda campus. Like I was telling the press, there's no reason, you can't use that for an excuse, we're closing down in so many years. There's still soldiers coming in today and tomorrow and the next day. That stuff needs to get fixed here now before those problems get worse for the new soldiers coming in. Myself, I got two months left here at Walter Reed and I'm going back to my unit. I'm sure, I don't know how long Sergeant Sar Shannon has. I'm sure when he leaves, the guy behind him is not going to live in the same conditions or deal with the same problems that we're having now. Those need to get fixed before Walter Reed closes down. That's not an excuse. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of the witnesses for testifying as well and add my voice to those who have thanked you and your families for your service to the country and the sacrifices uh, you have made. And as uh, Mrs. McLeod said, uh, you know, you and your loved ones have been fighting a war. You shouldn't have to come back here and fight a system. Right. And I think that's absolutely uh, correct. And we need to make sure that the system provides you the respect uh, you need. And what we've heard, unfortunately, is a system that has been providing more neglect uh, than respect, at least with respect to outpatients. Uh, that we're dealing with. And as others have said, I think you've done a terrific service to the country. And if you look at the front page of today's Washington Post, uh, you'll find that because of the issues you've raised here uh, at Walter Reed, others around the country who are facing similar circumstances uh, will have their voices heard and will be empowered uh, now. So you have done a great service not just here at Walter Reed, uh, but around the country uh, as well. We all hear from time to time about those insurance companies uh, that tell people, you know, we want to take care of you when you're in trouble uh, and advertise as such. Uh, but when time comes to pay claims for certain insurance companies, they're not there. And they try and make their money and make their savings by denying claims. That's clearly not a model that we want the United States government uh, and U.S. military to be following. But from your testimony about your own personal circumstances as well as other stories as well as reports from the GAO and others, uh, clearly when it comes to disability claims, uh, it does appear that the system <coughs> has been stacked against uh, individuals uh, like your, yourself and your loved ones. And Mr. Waxman quoted uh, from the statement <coughs> Mr. Chu uh, made uh, in 2005, suggesting that the health care we have to provide to our veterans is somehow a burden on the system that we somehow uh, shouldn't be having to, to deal with. Let me uh, ask you with respect to the, the system itself. Uh, and GAO essentially has said, and I do want to mention from their report, in conclusion, they issued a long report about the disability, military disability evaluation 
uh, system uh, back in 2006. Uh, they concluded that DOD is not adequately monitoring disability evaluation outcomes in reserve and active duty disability uh, cases and said that there had been a lack of training, a lack of monitoring, and a lack of oversight. Uh, and it's clearly an area I think this committee uh, is going to be taking a look at and other members of Congress, other committees in Congress. Do you have any specific recommendations with respect to that disability uh, system, uh, which clearly seems to be designed more to essentially put an overwhelming burden on the individual seeking to show that their disabilities have been related uh, to their service uh, and not providing uh, an ample opportunity uh, for, for the individual. I don't know if you have any specific recommendations with respect to that, that process. With our process, like I said, we were fortunate. And we took the compensation because he got the 50 percent. The thing about it is they never acknowledged that he has a brain injury. So they didn't compensate. They compensated for the cognitive disorder. My thing is they're so busy trying to make everything acceptable. Several things on his med board was acceptable, but yet they still retired him. How can everything be acceptable? if you're going to be retired. Um, that's a little contradictory to me. They gave him, for the anxiety and for the cognitive disorder, they gave him the 30 percent with the attitude in April of next year when we have to come back, he's going to be better. What if he's better? Which I really at this point don't see happening. If he's better, he'll lose that rating. And guess what? He'll get a severance package and then he'll have nothing. I don't think if the, if the injury warrants it, I don't think there ought to be a TDRL. If you, the brain injury is permanent. What they've taught him is compensatory measures. If he hadn't had a brain injury, <coughs> why were they teaching him uh, compensation measures to help him out? That's contradictory again. My thing is, if you're wanted a compensation, it ought to be permanent. Not something you've got to bargain for 18 months down the road. And then we may not have insurance. Then we're going to have to get all his treatment at the VA. What about the families? What are they supposed to do? I'll have nothing. But all because we still have to bargain up to five years with the Army. He didn't bargain when he signed the line. He didn't bar you, uh, bargain when he got injured. Why are you bargaining now? Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Thank you. Mr. Hodes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding these hearings. And uh, to the witnesses, um, thank you so much. Um, you have been very brave. And uh, your courage is being heard around the country now. Uh, and it's very important um, what you have done in shedding light on what's going on here is 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 very important. And I know that um, the feelings that we feel hearing what you're saying um, are only a very small little piece of the feelings you felt and what you've gone through. So thank you for being here, um, uh, Staff Sergeant Shannon. I I want to. Um, ask you, uh, you've talked about the help you got from Danny Soto. Um, do you think that uh, there needs to be some independent office or agency that is committed to fighting for the soldiers in this system? Yes, I do. And to clarify, I haven't received any help from Danny Soto yet. I have guided other people to him, and I'm sure he's helped many others, but I haven't been able to start the MEB process. And the, excuse me, to make it easier to understand, <coughs> the medical retirement process because of the holdups I've gone through. And when I get to that point, I'll be looking him up. Thanks for that clarification. Mrs. McLeod, do you think there needs to be some independent officer agency? that fights for the soldier in this system whose only duty is to the soldier and not to the system but to the soldier. I think you ought to stop giving it to committees and give it to the families. That's who you need to be talking to. 
Give it to the ones that have to deal day in and day out. What do you think the best way for us to give that power, if you will, to the families would be, in your opinion? There needs to be a, a committee formed with a couple of spouses, a couple of people that have the power to get the things done. And there needs to be a forum set up to say, okay, we'll research the families and the situations. We know because we've been there. And we need to set action into force. This is what they say they need. Weigh it against exactly where we are today and give them what they need instead of sitting there waiting on somebody else to do it. Specialist Duncan? I don't really have nothing to say on that matter. I mean, I'm not going through the same process as they are. So, I mean. Thanks. Uh, Staff Sergeant Shannon, uh, your picture appeared on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, before your picture appeared, I understand that you were reporting to formation once a week. Is that correct? That's correct. After your picture appeared, my understanding is that you were ordered to report to formation daily. Is that correct? That is correct. And who gave you that order after your picture appeared to report daily to formation? That was, uh, those instructions were passed on to me by my platoon sergeant. He said they came from the sergeant major. And did you uh, inquire about the reason for your being ordered to report to formation daily after your picture appeared in the Washington Post? I just follow orders. Did you consider that retribution against you for uh, going public with your story? Um, I really couldn't say. I mean, they tell me to stay home because I tend to break things if I hang around too much and I don't work well in complex environments. Um, so when they told me that, I'm like, fine. And the next time I decide to break somebody's arm or smash a piece of furniture or something, they'll just tell me to go back to my room again. Uh, Specialist Duncan, have you experienced anything that you think might be retribution for your going public? I can't say exactly, maybe for sure, yes, but I mean, all of a sudden, the moving of rooms, moving from building to building, uh, it's just all of a sudden, quickly, all I ask them to do is fix the walls, not move me a million times. I don't know about some soldiers, I'm tired of moving rooms. I've, I've acquired a lot of bit of things being here for a year, and Moving's not fun anymore. I'm just tired of moving here and moving there. I just wanted to fix it so I can deal with it. Mrs. McLeod, um, you had to end up coming to uh, a member of Congress to get help for your situation. Yes, sir. After that, I think they were afraid to t retaliate. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank the witnesses. Uh, I'm at the end of the line here, and I want to tell you that it's been a very moving uh, experience for me to hear each of you tell your stories. My concern is that this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, my concern is that there is a culture of disregard uh, that has no place uh, in how we treat wounded veterans. And uh, uh, my concern is that there is a lack of commitment uh, to recognize the obvious, and that is that the cost of the war has to include uh, the cost of caring for the warrior. Um, I'm going to yield the balance of my time because I appreciate that uh, you've been answering lots of questions. And my questions have been asked and very eloquently answered. So I, I thank you uh, for your service. Well, thank you, Mr. Welch. Nice Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, thank all of you for being here today. And as I uh, listened uh, to your testimony, I, I just said to myself, uh, <coughs> this, is, this should not be happening in America. It sounds as if we have a system which um, should be in intensive care and appears that we're putting Band-Aids on it. And as I listened to you, you know, I was just wondering, um, you know, in another hearing on another committee, I sit on armed services also, and we had uh, Sergeant Shannon and to all of you some testimony that there was a, um, a lack of uh, psychiatrists and mental health people uh, in the, the military and that they were trying to find more. The mental health piece of the treatment uh, here, how have you found that? I've had no problems with it, sir. You, have you, have you uh, Sergeant Shannon? Well, 
Um, I, I, I have a big problem with their mental health thing. It, it, it's starting with their traumatic brain injury testing. Okay. First of all, they tell me I have no loss of cognitive function. Well, how can they do that if they give me a traumatic brain injury test that, in my opinion, my six-year-old son could pass? Because it's designed for severely traumatically brain injured people. I know myself, and I know I have paid a price for the brain injury I received. And if they, if they can't even take the time to bounce sc scores from tests I could take today that I've taken before and see what the difference is, I've got a big problem with that. Now. The counseling and everything that they give, from the psychiatrist to the psychologist, PTSD counseling, I, th I believe they're running a tremendous program, and we have access to a program called Polytrauma Recovery. And it's a tremendous program run out of the Washington, D.C. VA. However, the biggest problem they have is um, none of the service members will receive benefit from that program until each individual soldier has reached a mental state where they're willing to go uh, seek that treatment. One of the questions that I'd asked some members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in, in this other hearing uh, so went to the Bob, Bob Woodruff piece that ran on ABC News uh, a few nights ago with regard to brain trauma and trauma to the head and how people can get treatment here at Walter Reed, for example, but then when they go back to their uh, rural areas or wherever they may go, to the small towns or whatever, that they were not able to get follow-up, and so they found themselves going backwards. Is that a concern of yours, Staff Ab Sergeant? Absolutely. It, it is very much a concern of mine, beginning with... For me, starting with the beginning of the process of seeking the treatment, where I was told, well, you're not a bad enough brain injury uh, to, to need the polytrauma recovery. And, I, you know, um, I got angry enough I had to uh, get up and leave, usually when I've, I've gotten angry. And, uh, well, I'm a sergeant. I, foul language starts coming out of my mouth. And, and that's the point where I know a trigger's coming and I'm going to get violent. Um, but they tell me I'm, I, I don't have a bad enough brain injury to need treatment. I have found out since then I'm clearly a level two polytrauma recovery person. The point being that proper over, well, proper supervision would be the word that I would uh, have to use in relation to that subject. Um, they have discovered that men suffer post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms from uh, concussive force to their heads. We get mortared every day over there, depending on where we're working. Just because a guy's got not got a visible injury doesn't mean he hasn't got PTSD. What, what about you, Miss McLeod, a year with regard to your husband? When my husband was, was here, they gave him psychological evaluation treatment uh, because they thought it was just a transition problem. I kept fighting and fighting. I knew there was something wrong. When they sent him to Virginia, he was treated there as well. When he come back, he got so out of hand that a friend of ours, who's also, her husband's a brain injury patient, she actually took him to her husband's psychiatrist. And that's how he got started with the psychiatry. They never offered him any psychiatric treatment. Well, let me say this, that uh, I have about 30 seconds less left. What I'm hoping for is that we will not, or not us, but even other congressmen in five years will not be sitting here going through these same things. Hopefully, uh, with Secretary Gates looking at the system and having the system revamped, uh, we'll be able to resolve a lot of these problems. And we thank you very, very much for your service. And and uh, we can do better as a country. We must do better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Ms. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I thank you and Chairman Tierney uh, and Ranking Member Davis and Chase for your courtesy. I'm a member of the full committee, not of the subcommittee. I'm very proud of this hospital all my life. Pr proud, been proud to have it in my, in my district. I just want to say for the record, all the indications are that it is still the crown jewel, is still state of the art hospital on the planet for treating uh, soldiers like you. To say thank you for your service sounds so shallow uh, after what you've gone through both uh, in battle and here that I want to just move first to Ms. McLeod, because thank you for your service, um, must include you, uh, who have been uh, apparently a volunteer caseworker with considerable family sacrifice, having to give up home and job to come here. Uh, uh, I was very concerned when you said, what about those who don't have me? Because that's what I've been thinking as a mother the whole time. 
Uh, what about those who don't have Mrs. McLeod? May I ask, uh, uh, I mean, when you said you didn't even know, uh, you weren't even informed when your husband was wounded, were you ever officially informed no. that he was wounded? Unbelievable. So no somehow one, No he, one from the Army ever picked up the telephone and called and said, there's been an accident. Nobody called me. He called me himself. I, this, this, I think, uh, the points the has... systemic nature of the problem. It begins on the battlefield and carries through throughout the, 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 the life of the soldier. Um, let, me, let me ask you, uh, all three of you, um, w roughly, you cannot know, you've not done, done a census, but you've been around this hospital. Percent, roughly, what percentage of soldiers are here without family, are here by themselves? I'd probably say about 25% or so, maybe less. I've seen a lot of people here just by themselves. 25% are here with family? Without. Without family. So 75% of the soldiers here have some family here. Is that your estimate. sense as well? I don't, I'm not sure I would go that high, but definitely in the high range. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I believe is, is being discovered right now is that having a caring family member close during this time of recovery is, is incredibly beneficial to these soldiers as they go through this process. Um, these people understand them. Sometimes they are not uh, coherent based on uh, medications and things. And it takes someone with in intimate knowledge of, of that individual and how they were on a daily basis before to understand um, some of what they're trying to get across and some of uh, what they're going through based on their well, knowledge of them before. Ms. McLeod, I appreciate uh, what you said about, well, you know, leave it to the families because families obviously want to take care of their folks. But the fact is there are very few uh, me... women like you in the United States today who give up everything and move here. I, I, I won't have much time, so I'm gonna, I want to move on to beyond accountability. They fired some people, you know. They knew they had to do something. I want to move to remedy. And given the, the systemic nature of the problem, uh, that a soldier's life may be on dozens of computers which don't talk to one another and the rest. I'm not focused so much on long-term remedies because I think uh, you know the Army can, can plunge into long-term remedies and we have the same situation we have now. Uh, we, we learn, for example, that uh, a soldier could come here and not know, not even given a piece of paper at one point at least saying, okay, this is what you do, A, B, C. These are kind of short-term guidance that you would expect for, for any, any wounded soldier. You might not expect for Eleanor Holmes Norton. She's supposed to be able to know if she comes to find the doctor. Uh, but l let me ask you, given the systemic nature of the problem, whether or not uh, a remedy... Uh, uh, might involve um, immediate uh, assignment of, of people who have no, uh, given what you've said about conflict of interest in the rest, no obligation to anybody but the soldier and how many such, not how many, but if that was to happen, should it be from veterans organizations? Who would you like to direct that question, Mr. I would like to direct that to anyone who could give me. Basically, it is, if you think the soldiers would be better treated if there were people outside of the system, the first people that occur to me are people from veterans organizations. Would those be people who would be most likely in the short term to be responsive to the needs you have discussed in your testimony? Would one of you like to respond to that? No question in my mind. They've been through it. They need to be advocates for it. And when it comes down to... Well, like, like my uh, total being lost completely in the system when I went outpatient, the, uh, when I complained about it, they informed me that I had spoken to someone within 24 hours of my arriving at the hospital. Anybody want to laugh? I was under a lot of medication. I have no knowledge of anybody speaking to me within that time frame. In other words, they need to assess the patients and give a, 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 a time, say, out, uh, brief them when they go outpatient instead of when they arrive <laughs> on an aircraft from Germany. Thank you. The gentlewoman's time has expired. All time has expired for questioning. I want to thank on behalf of all the committee members and, and everyone else uh, your willingness to come here, your commitment, and your sacrifice that you've made as well. We all, we all wish you a, a speedy recovery for those of you that are injured, and, and uh, Dell as well, Mrs. McLeod, and view your situation to ease. <laughs> your coming here is a continuation of your service. Uh, I think you've really benefited uh, others that will come through here and others that are presently in, in the system somewhere. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to take your testimony and, 
uh, work toward improving situations as well. So with that, we thank you very, very much. We'll allow you to uh, take your leave now and step down. We appreciate all of your time and commitment. Thank you. Now we'll invite our second panel also to uh, take the seat as soon as they can. General Kevin Kiley, MD, the Surgeon General of the Army and the past commander at Walter Reed. We have Major General George Waitman, former commander of the Walter Reed Army Medical Center and North Atlantic Regional Medical Command. And we have Ms. Cynthia Bisquetta, the Director of the Health Care Department at the United States Government Accountability Office. Welcome to you all. Thank you for coming today. Uh, as you heard before, it's our um, policy of the subcommittee to square you in to testify and ask if you'd rise and raise your right hand, please. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I record will reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And with that, if, if we might, uh, I would like to ask each of you to give a brief summary of your testimony. Your full testimony will be entered on the record. Uh, you have five minutes. So obviously, we'll try to keep as close to that time as, as we can, and we'll try to give you some indication that you're nearing uh, the end if we can. And so we'll start. Uh, Lieutenant General Kyle, please. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Uh, Chase, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Davis, and the distinguished members of this committee, I'm here today to address uh, your concerns about the quality of care, the quality of administrative process, and the quality of life for our wounded warriors here at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and across all of our Army. I'm Lieutenant General Kevin Kiley. I'm the Surgeon General of the United States Army and the Commander of U.S. Army Medical Command. And as a commander, my first responsibility is for the health and welfare of my soldiers. As a physician, my first responsibility is the health and welfare of my patient. As we've seen over the last uh, several days, the housing condition uh, here in one of the buildings uh, at Walter Reed clearly has not met our standards. And for that, I am personally and professionally sorry. And I offer my apologies to the soldiers, the families, the civilian and military leadership of the Army and the Department of Defense, and to the nation. It's also clear that the complex and bureaucratic administration systems that support the Medical Evaluation Board and the Physical Evaluation Board are complex and demand urgent simplification. I'm dedicated to doing everything in my power and authority to bring a positive change to this process. Simply put, I am in command, and as I share these failures, I also accept the responsibility and the challenge for rapid corrective action. We're taking immediate actions to improve the living conditions and welfare of our soldier patients, to increase responsiveness of our leaders and the medical system, and to enhance support services for families of our wounded soldiers. We're taking action to put into place long-term solutions for the complex bureaucratic medical evaluation process that's impacting on our soldiers. Living conditions in Building 18 at Walter Reed are not acceptable. We're fixing them now, and as of this morning, we've moved out all but six soldiers uh, to other better accommodations on the campus. Although Walter Reed uh, Base Ops Operations staff has corrected some of the things that you've seen in the paper, uh, we are taking immediate action to begin more extensive renovations of the roof, the exterior. We're going to remodel the bathrooms, put new carpets, new air conditioning units into this facility to bring it up to what we consider to be acceptable standards. Uh, Lieutenant General Bob Wilson, the commander of the Installation Command, and I have sent a team out across uh, 11 or so installations to look at uh, similar bureaucratic, administrative, uh, uh, and uh, clinical conditions and infrastructure conditions to ensure that our other installations uh, do not have uh, issues associated with here at Walter Reed. So uh, we know that we've had some brick and mortar problems and we're fixing them. But we've got human problems here too and this is about soldiers and their families. America's soldiers go to war and they're confident that if they're injured, they'll be returned to a first-class medical facility. It's said that a soldier won't charge an objective out of sight of a medic. For us, it's the 68 whiskey. And there's a connection between that 68 whiskey on the battlefield, the transportation system, the air, air vac system, Longstool Regional Medical Center, and Walter Reed and the rest of our facilities that is unbroken. 
and nothing can be allowed to shake the confidence in that system to include the superb uh, performance of Walter Reed in ensuring that our soldiers are cared for. Secretary Gates has made it very clear that he expects decisive action and he and our soldiers will get it. You know, the system that we use to decide if a soldier is medically fit for continued service or if not, determine the appropriate disability system and transferring to the VA is complex, confusing, and frustrating. What we've realized over these last uh, four to five years is the nature of the injuries these soldiers receive is also very complex, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. The tactics, techniques, and procedures we use uh, in the asymmetric battlefield uh, are required to be changed to adjust to our enemies. The procedures that we use in our medical system need to be changed appropriately as we see uh, the, the uh, circumstances surrounding our soldiers and their disabilities change. And what we really need to do, in my opinion, is to make this whole process less confrontational, less adversarial. To meet the uh, human factor changes, we're making some adjustments here at Walter Reed. I think you've heard some of that already. We're bringing on more nurse uh, case managers, more physical evaluation board liaison officers, and more physicians to review medical uh, cases. This will lower the case ratio for case managers, improve uh, communications, and speed the processing of paperwork. We really need to reinvent this process, and we have a team now looking at iterative analysis of the MEB process, the PEB process, to see if we can better improve it. The two most uh, common complaints we hear from soldiers about the MEB, PEB process is that uh, we take too long uh, or we rush soldiers through. So we need to be very careful to simultaneously provide soldiers the very best medical care that modern science and medicine in America can offer, while at the same time ensuring that the rights of those soldiers to a full and equitable analysis is protected. And we will be very careful to protect the quality of the care and the fair assessment of soldier disability. We, we want all these soldiers to return to their units or to their homes as quickly as we can, but we want them to benefit from a full capability of modern medicine. We want to do it right. Your Army medical professionals have earned a tremendous reputation during this war. The marvels of uh, modern technology uh, have allowed us to bring more soldiers off the battlefield, increase their survival rates. The training of our combat medics and our frontline surgeons, the equipment we've placed, as I referenced earlier, our Air Force uh, counterparts and their CCAT teams, moving soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines around the world is unprecedented. We can bring soldiers from the battlefield to this great facility in 36 hours or less. General, I, uh, your records are going to be put on the comments yes, will be put on the record. So if you could help us by uh, just concluding, I will, sir. Uh, Thank you. In summary, I'd say that the staff here at Walter Reed, the technologies we have applied, and the unwavering support of Congress and the American people uh, have made all this uh, happen. It's regrettable that uh, it took the Washington Post to bring some of this to light, but in, in retrospect, uh, it will help us accelerate the process of making change and improving things. Uh, I'm committed personally to regaining the trust of the American people the soldiers and their families everywhere uh, that our Army Medical Department system can be trusted and it is the best in the world. I've served in the Army for 30 years as a physician and a soldier, taking care of patients and serving our nation, and I remain honored to command and lead uh, the great uh, men and women in the Army Medical Department. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General. General Waitman. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Davis, Congressman Shays, distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear today to discuss the problems about which we're all concerned brought to light at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. I am Major General George Waitman, and I commanded the North Atlantic Regional Medical Command and Walter Reed Army Medical Center from 25 August 2006 until last week. Secretary of Defense Gates, all of our Army leaders, and you have called this a failure of leadership. I agree. I was Walter Reed Commander, and from what we see with some soldiers' living conditions, and the administrative challenges we faced in the complex medical board, physical evaluation board processes, it is clear mistakes were made and I was in charge. We can't fail one of these soldiers or their families, not one, and we did. There's another point on which I believe we should agree because it's important that American people and our soldiers in harm's way believe that both inpatient and outpatient medical care delivered by the professional health care team at Walter Reed are superb. They're not two separate medical systems of care at Walter Reed, 
Outpatients are seen by the same doctors and nurses as the inpatients. Outpatient medical care is not second class. It's on par with our inpatient care. You have seen this on your visits, and our soldiers and families deserve it. Having said that, I acknowledge there are problems and frustrations with the process of accessing and following up on that outpatient care, and we are aggressively seeking ways and implementing solutions to make that system more responsive, more efficient, more effective, and more compassionate. We did not see where some of these, some of these soldier patients were living, and we should have. There are 371 rooms on Walter Reed where we house our outpatients at Walter Reed. 26 rooms in Building 18 were in need of repairs. We should not have allowed that to happen because our soldiers deserve better, and it is important to their overhaul, rehabilitation, and well-being, which is entrusted to us. Also, we did not fully recognize the frustrating bureaucratic and administrative processes some of these soldiers go through. We should have, and in this, I failed. Over the last two weeks, we have heard of problems from months and years ago Many of them individually fixed immediately, but we obviously missed the big picture because not one of those soldiers deserves to be satisfied. I'm disappointed that I will not be able to continue and lead the changes we must make to care for these soldiers and their families, but I respect the Army's decision. I retain, and I hope that you would share, the confidence in the abilities of the Army's leaders' commitment and the Army Medical Department, wonderful health care professionals to care for soldiers, and create the innovative and long overdue process changes we all agree are needed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I hope you, my testimony today will allow us to address these problems and start to reaffirm America's confidence in Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Thank you, sir. Ms. Fisqueda. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, <coughs> thank you for inviting me here today to discuss GAO's work on the challenges encountered by soldiers who sustained serious injuries in service to our nation. Our work has shown the array of significant medical and, and administrative challenges these soldiers face throughout their recovery process as they navigate the DOD and VA health care and disability systems. As you know, blasts and fragments from IEDs, landmines, and other explosive devices cause about 65 percent of their injuries, and many more of the wounded are surviving serious injuries that would have been fatal in prior wars. But the miracle of battlefield medicine is also the enduring hardship of the war borne by the soldiers and their families. Following acute hospital care, their recovery often requires comprehensive inpatient rehabilitation to address complex cognitive, physical, and psychological impairments. This exacts a huge toll on the patients and their families. My testimony today is based on conditions we found during the time of our audit work regarding problems with the sharing of medical records, provision of vocational rehabilitation, screening for post-traumatic stress disorder, and military pay. In 2006, we reported that DOD and VA had problems sharing medical records for service members transferred from DOD to VA polytrauma centers. These VA facilities were mandated in statute to help treat seriously injured active duty service members returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Yet two VA facilities lacked real-time access to electronic medical records at DOD facilities. VA physicians reported a time-consuming process involving multiple faxes and phone calls to get information they needed to treat their patients. I emphasize that these are patients still on active duty, not veterans. About three weeks ago, it was reported that DOD cut off VA physicians' access to DOD medical records because the two bureaucracies had not finalized data use agreements. It's hard to fathom such action and the potentially adverse effects that it could have had on patient care. In 2005, we reported that seriously injured soldiers may not be able to benefit from early intervention services provided by VA. GAO put federal disability programs on its high-risk list in part because they lack focus on returning people with disabilities to work. The importance of early intervention for restoring injured persons to their full potential is well documented in the literature. But DOD expressed concerns that VA's efforts to intervene early could have conflicted with the military's retention goals. <laughs> Meanwhile, soldiers treated as outpatients in military or VA hospitals were waiting months 
for DOD to assess whether they would be able to return to active duty. We recommended that VA and DOD collaborate to reach an agreement for VA to have access to information that both agencies agree is needed to promote recovery and return to work, either in the military or in the civilian sector. Also in 2006, we reported that DOD screened service members for PTSD as part of its post-deployment health assessment, but could not reasonably assure that those who needed referrals received them. We found that only 22 percent of those who may have been at risk of developing PTSD had been referred for further mental health evaluation. DOD had not identified the factors its clinical providers used in making referrals, but concurred with our recommendation to do so. As early as 2004, we also reported that officials at six out of seven VA facilities were concerned about meeting an increasing demand for PTSD services from new veterans returning from the war. They estimated that giving priority to these veterans, as they had been directed to do, could delay appointments for veterans already receiving PTSD services <coughs> by up to 90 days. Compounding their health and rehabilitation struggles, we reported to this committee in 2005 and 2006 that problems related to military pay had resulted in overpayments and debt for hundreds of sick and injured soldiers on active duty and in the National Guard and Reserves. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of combat in injured soldiers were pursued for repayment of debt incurred through no fault of their own, including at least 74 who were reported to credit bureaus and collection agencies. As a result of our audit, we understand that manual overrides are in place to help prevent this problem, but that the underlying payment systems have not been fixed. We also found that administrative problems had caused some injured reserve component soldiers to be dropped from active duty. And for some, this led to significant gaps in both pay and health insurance. In summary, I would not want to overlook the dedication and compassion of the many providers we've met at DOD and VA facilities throughout the course of our work. But the cumulative message from our body of work is that too often, our wounded soldiers have been poorly served or at risk of falling through the cracks of the two bureaucracies responsible for their health and well-being. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Pesquetta. <coughs> uh, uh, General Kiley, I understand that you might have some time constraints. We can either address questions to you and go through a round and, and then go back to the other two panelists, or if you can, can you stay and uh, we'll deal with it as a panel. Uh, sir, you know, I'm at, I'm at your discretion. Thank you. Uh, however you'd like to do that. Thank you. Then, General Kiley, you were in charge of this facility at Walter Reed uh, from 2002 to 2004. Is That's that correct. correct? Yes, How many sir. months were you here altogether? Uh, I believe I assumed command in uh, June. So I, it was just about 24 months. I haven't stopped just about the full two years. Yes, sir. And following you was, uh, was a General Farmer? Yes, sir. And he was here from 2004 to July of 2006? Yes, sir. Or early August, I think. I, I'm at and then, General Waitman, you came in in July of 06 uh, to March of, uh, of 2007, a relatively short period of time compared to your predecessors. Correct. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Now, General Waitman, when you came in, uh, platoon sergeants and case managers, there were a significant, uh, there was a significant gap in a the ratio. There was a lot of soldiers, 125, 130, to each platoon sergeant. Is that correct? No, no sir, that's not correct. What is the number that was there? Yeah. The, the ratios that you cite were um, present uh, when we peaked out uh, of our med hold and med hold overpopulation in the summer of 2005. Before you even came? Yes, sir. Okay. And the, at that point, it realized we, we only had one company to take care of all those soldiers. In January of 2006, just a little over a year ago, a second company was created. And that's when we split out the active duty um, wounded warriors into the medical hold company, and that's when the ratio dropped down from 1 to 125 to 1 to 50 to 55 for the active duty soldiers and for the med, hold sol med holdover soldiers, the reserve component soldiers, that ratio was 1 to 25. Thank you, sir. And uh, you were quoted in one of the articles that appeared uh, saying that you had also ordered your staff to focus on the high risk priorities such as PTSD. Um, was that not the case before you made the order, that the, the focus wasn't to the level that you wanted it to be? Sir, uh, it became apparent to me that uh, we need to, to focus on uh, 
two different groups. Um, we need to focus on the groups that have been here the longest to see why they had been here so long and if it was bureaucratic or clinical hurdles that they were still facing. And there was another group that we found uh, that had either history of substance abuse, uh, uh, behavioral health issues, domestic violence or, uh, or alcohol abuse that we wanted to keep a very close eye on to make sure that they got the care in an expeditious manner that, that they could. Well, none of these things were new to your watch, though. Uh, these situations had been as predominant uh, in, Mr. in General Farmer's watch and uh, presumably before that as well, correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at some point in time, uh, General Waitman, uh, the garrison commander, Peter Garibaldi, I believe sent an internal Army memo to you uh, talking about uh, the situation here with competitive sourcing initiative, mm -hmm. the President's initiative uh, allowing the Office of Management and Budget under what they call the Circular uh, 76 to, I'm sorry? A76. The A76. Allow you to uh, bid out the private contractors, let them submit a bid in competition with the federal employees uh, in that process. And I think, you know, uh, some of us were looking at that memo and, and were a bit disturbed because it seemed to call to your attention uh, issues in a reduction in force, a reduction of those employees that was pretty substantial fall off. And the, uh, the commander's comments to you uh, were basically that there was a great risk uh, to the whole operation here as a result of that sharp decline. He warned that the workload had grown exponentially since September 11th, obviously, because of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, that without favorable consideration of the request for increased staff, that the entire base operations of patient care services are at risk of mission failure. Can you tell us uh, what led up to his writing that memo to you and then what action you took with respect to that memo and what response, as you put that up the chain, occurred? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, the A-76 process has been going on for, I think, about three or four years here at, right. at Walter Reed, and it's been bounced back and forth who, who wins that contract, whether the government does or the independent contractor. Um, as a result, I think that, that not knowing what was going to be uh, in the future has affected uh, the workforce, in particular the one on garrison operations. Uh, when um, Colonel Garibaldi uh, floated that memo to me, uh, it, it was it outlined where and what areas that we uh, were at greatest risk. Um, we passed that uh, memo up to our higher headquarters. and. Um, got support from them. However, I, I will add at that point that about that same time or within a month or two after passing that memo up, we got, we got support for that, but we were not able to hire the additional workers that we requested because the contract had been awarded to the contractor as opposed to government services. And, and previously, the government had performed all those services itself. So we had trouble attracting uh, all the ne necessary people that we needed to those positions. It's reported, General Waitman, that in September of 2004, the Army actually determined that the in-house federal workforce at Walter Reed could perform the support services at a lower cost than the bid that was received from the outside contractor, which is IAP Worldwide Services. Despite that, uh, there was an appeal taken, and we've seen no record of why this happened, but apparently the certification of the federal employees was withdrawn. Unilaterally, the uh, employee bid was raised about $7 million, and the determination was reversed in favor of the private company IAP. Can you tell us about that process and what happened there? No, sir, I cannot. That happened before I came. As a result of that, um, a number of people, at least according to this memo, went from about 300 people down to about 60 on February 3 of 2007. Had you seen your... Uh, personnel declined to that degree? Uh, sir, not to that degree. They did decline uh, from a workforce normally of about 190. It declined to close to 100. Thank you. Did not get down to 60, but did get down to 100. Thank you. General Kiley, did this uh, process of uh, the uh, competitive sourcing initiative happen on your watch? Uh, yes, sir. I, it began on my watch, and then uh, the issues of awarding the, the uh, contract uh, first to the MEO and then the appeals was after I left Walter Reed and took command of MedCom. And it, so you were not there when the uh, reversal of determination came over from the federal employees to the I, private I company? I think that was in the fall of 04, sir, and I was not the commander then. So where is General Farmer these days? Sir, I think he's retired. He's retired. And it would it have been on his watch then that that whole process would have played out and at some point the uh, private contractor would have been given the award for $120 million over five years? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, under, under the direction of the Army and the contracting services that manage those, and I don't know specifically the name of that. I, 
General Farmer would not specifically make the decision as to who to award the contract to. Uh, those those decisions are made, uh, I believe, by Army, uh, not by us. If I'm if I'm correct on that, Mr. Chase. Hey, I'd like Mr. Davis to go, and then I'll just follow him if he's Mr. Mr. Davis. I mean, I think these problems are far more systematic than going back to uh, in A76 or anything else, or even some of the things happening just right here in the post. Uh, what you have is a number of stovepipes. You have the Army uh, not talking to the VA. You have the National Guard and the Army <coughs> not speaking to each other, and people are falling through the cracks. And Ms. Bassetti, would you agree with that? Yes, I would. These are systemic problems that have been uh, really, we've known about these for years, haven't we? That's correct. And this recent manifestation really shouldn't surprise anybody. In mm -hmm. fact, when I look back at a memorandum uh, of the 12th of October, 2006, uh, this is after Walter Reed officials were asked to attend our committee's quarterly briefing on medical holdovers. I requested a copy of the Assistant Secretary's um, analysis and review of their SAR report. This review was conducted by individuals from all of the medical commands involved in all of the processes, including installation management. It clearly indicates the review teams had concerns with Building 18 billeting, staffing, the soldier's handbook, training, outprocessing, separation transition, uh, patient transportation, and the medical evaluation boards. Attached to the review is a memo that was signed by Colonel Ronald Hamilton, the commander that indicates uh, that you, uh, uh, General Waitman, and General Kiley received a copy of this review in October. Do you remember receiving a copy or getting briefed on it? Yes, sir, I do. How about you, General? I Kyle? believe I did, too. Yes, sir. So it really wasn't the Washington Post. You knew these were problems. You may not have known specifically what it looked like, and you may not have been able to put faces and stories behind it, but this was an ongoing concern, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, yes, sir. Well, yeah. yes, sir. I, and it was not just at Walter Reed. We were concerned about the medical hold opera holdover operations and medical hold operations at all of our installations. So what did you do when you saw this report in October? We know what you're doing now after the Post articles. What did you do in October to try to stay ahead of it? Uh, my, my staff informed me that the Walter Reed staff was working it, that they recognized that there were issues and uh, that they were taking action. Sir, sir may I yeah, address some of the specifics on that? We realized uh, to address some of the problems with how long it took uh, our patients to get through the medical board process that we needed more physicians trained on the MEB process and to help move those uh, records. So we added three different physicians part-time to work on those records and we also designated an 06, a colonel, to be in charge of that whole process. We also recognized we didn't have enough of the Peblo counselors available, and, and I think you've already heard from previous testimony, their role in, in counseling and being the patient's advocate uh, in this whole process. Realized that they needed more training and they, they were inadequate in number. So we've increased those, uh, and, and that started after this report. We also realized that uh, we didn't have enough of the case managers as well to, be, to work with the patients within the medical hold and medical holdover companies, and we became, began active recruiting uh, efforts for those as well. General Carly, you're no stranger to this committee. You came before us in 2005. During your testimony, um, at that point, you assured us that improvements were being made to the medical holdover process. This was at the point where we had uh, uh, numerous soldiers come up and talk about how they'd fallen through the process, how they languished. Their orders would be uh, they'd l leave from the Army and go back to the Guard, and uh, they were in kind of a limbo. And you, you report at that point, uh, you, you stated under oath, MHO soldiers can expect their treatment and recovery experience to meet or exceed that of the active component because the Army Surgeon General has made their care uh, the medical treatment facility's top priority. That was your position at that point. Yes, sir. But it didn't happen, did it? Sir, you know, in my role as the MEDCOM commander, Walter Reed was not my only command. Uh, the southeastern <laughs> west with Brooke and Tripler. And my discussions routinely with my senior commanders, we discussed the issues of uh, medical holdover processing because we had often heard, I'd heard as the Walter Reed commander, that our Reserve and National Guard soldiers felt like they were not getting the same priority as active duty. So I made it clear that, that at a minimum there would be no difference. And in many cases, these soldiers, because they were staying at our camps, posts, and stations instead of going home, there was a sense of urgency to get them to the head of the line, to get the evaluations done. And, and my comments about a good news story was, uh, was the numbers of soldiers that we were able to heal and return to the force on the order of magnitude of about 80% of those soldiers in med holdover. 
So my my take in this and my my comments to your committee were that while we have problems and we continue to have those problems, uh, we were still uh, caring for and and healing and returning to the force a large number. Our problem, I think, is is a systemic problem yes, that we have more people coming back yes, than sir. was anticipated. We have antiquated systems integrating yes, the reserves and the guard and the army back and forth. It's a paperwork nightmare. Yes, it's a labyrinth that you need a PhD and a law degree and you still couldn't navigate yourself yes, through. And the frustration of these poor injured veterans coming yes, back, yes, it is systemic. And I'm afraid this is just the tip of the iceberg that when we go out into the field, we may find more of this. Mr. Senator, do you have any comment on that as you look at it? Is that, is that a fair analysis that this is? I think that certainly from our, from our work, it would warrant a top to bottom review of the situation across the country. To keep putting a Band-Aid on something, it needs a complete overhaul, it seems to me. Correct. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Kiley, uh, according to a Washington Post article on Saturday, uh, former Army Secretary Francis Harvey described a telephone conversation that he had with you. <coughs> and he said that after the Walter Reed story broke in the Washington Post, you called him and lambasted the Washington report the Washington Post reports uh, as squal of squalid conditions, and you said the Post story was yellow journalism at its worst. Did you tell the Army Secretary you thought the Post story was yellow journalism at its worst? Sir, I, I had, um, as I remember, a couple of conversations uh, from the start of the publication of the Post with the Secretary. <coughs> I believe one was uh, in person. I had a discussion with him uh, over an article in the Army Times uh, where he asked me to call him back, and I called him back, told him I would go through that. And then I had a discussion with him when he called me. Well, whenever discussions you had sir, with him, did you say to one, him at one that that report was yellow journalism at its worst? I don't believe my comment uh, my comment to the Secretary about yellow journalism was directed at the, the, the larger report, but a follow-on article that, that took a series of uh, facts uh, that included me and, and began to say that, you know, what did I know and when did I know it? And I, I didn't think that was necessarily a fair article. And you're talking about the Washington Post articles? Yeah, all of them, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, are you denying the accounts of the soldiers uh, in the Post article or what happened no, to the soldiers? No, sir. No, sir. And uh, uh, then what were you? What were you I, outraged I, about? I, I was I was uh, disappointed that that uh, the articles characterized the fact that I had I had been the commander from 2002, yeah, and that I was aware of some of the circumstances that the Post was revealing in its stories in 2005 and 2006, and that somehow I had known about them. Uh, and other other parts of that article that I didn't think were accurate. So after you left, when did you leave? I left in 2004. After you left, you didn't know what happened here? No, sir, that, that's not correct. Uh, but I was the next higher commander. I had a two-star <laughs> commander in command managing Walter Reed as well as the North Atlantic region. Uh, and as with General Waitman, we had routine uh, video conferences to talk about issues, not just related to Med Holdover, uh, but to the BRAC, uh, to uh, A-76. Uh, you had these conversations <clears throat> complaining about how you were treated in the articles. Did you say in any of your conversations, we've got to do something, we've got to investigate this problem and straighten it out? To, I'm sorry, to who, sir? You, to uh, uh, to the, the um, Army, the, uh, the head of the Army. With oh, to so Secretary Harvey? Yes. Oh, yes, sir. We, we talked about getting engaged and finding out what was going on, getting an action plan together to fix those immediate problems that we could fix and starting to look at the long-term issues, some of which we had already been taking on to include my TBI task force, the mental health task force, and uh, issues at looking specifically at the MEB, PEB process. Now, uh, Chairman asked about this contracting out. And this contracting out, according to the memo that was prepared, which I presume you saw, is that correct? Uh, the, the Colonel Garibaldi's memo? Yes. yes, sir. You saw it, and, and General Whiteman, you saw that memo as well. Yes, sir. That, that memo uh, warned about the mission failure, in other words, the failure to provide care that Walter Reed was supposed to provide because of the loss of personnel. There were 350 government employees working here. The A-76 process decided to contract out that work mm -hmm to a private organization, but they didn't start for a whole year. And during that year, 
the people who knew they were going to lose their jobs started leaving. That's right. They went to the private sector. They went to other places in Department of Defense. They went wherever they could find new jobs. So by the time the new contractor took his place, a year later, as I understand it, there were only 60 employees left of the 350. You know whether that's an accurate statement, either of you? Sir, I think I think I addressed that earlier. Uh, I believe the the lower number was 100, not 60. And uh, I think we had 180 people earlier in the year. So it didn't go from uh, 300 think, plus down to You didn't think it 60. was 350. You, you think that's an inaccurate figure? I, I believe so, sir. Okay. So how many do you think were here when the, when the contract was let out? When, when the actual was about, was about 100, sir. About 100? Yes, sir. Okay. And how, and, many, and how many people were still here? Uh, when the contractor a year later took over? I, I'm sorry, sir. I misspoke. When the actual contractor took over on February 4th of 2007, that's when we had 100. <coughs> and a year... And a the memo said that you're short of staff. Contractor's taken over. You're short of staff. That The mission is threatened and asked for more staff to be hired. Was more staff hired? Yes, sir. I think I addressed that previously. Uh, we did get permission to hire more staff. Our ability to hire those additional 80 people um, was not successful in that they knew that the contract was coming up, and if they got hired, it would only be for four months. So, so out did of those the memo ask you to hire 80 more? Yes, sir. I believe it did. How many did you actually hire? Ten, sir. Ten? Yes, sir. Okay. And when did they come on board? Sir, I, I don't have that information, but it would be between October and December of 2006. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the only thing I would raise is we've contracted out so much of this war. We have mercenaries instead of U.S. Uh, military. We have contractors instead of the uh, work that could be done uh, with, by checking very carefully what kind of job they're doing. And here at Walter Reed, we had contracted out as well. And the result of all this is we are in, in Iraq overpaying for the work of the contractors, and here we're underserving our military, and something's got to be done about that. Thank well, I you. thank the gentleman. And remind you that the Comptroller General of the General Accountability <coughs> Office has made that same point, that the contracting out has, uh, has raised a problem. I suspect that we'll be exploring that in f future hearings. But, uh, General Waitman, just uh, you said there were 180 when it first went down, and then uh, down to 100 when yes, the sir. finally kicked in. So I think those are the numbers, right. at, at least. Uh, as opposed to the 350 and, and 60. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Shays. What, what I wrestle with is that there's not anyone involved in this that didn't know there were challenges. Uh, Mr. Waxman's gone through a, a whole host of reports, which he and I both can read and, and do read. Uh, how can we know when a problem is being addressed? In other words, this committee has had hearings and the word is back, you know, it's getting taken care of. Um, is it something where we need to have hearings every two months? And is there a psych is is there a mindset that to be a good soldier, you gotta basically, you know, stiff upper lip and just tell Congress, you know, we're taking care of it and so on, when you know you don't have the resources necessary to take care of it. I mean, that's what I'm wrestling with. I mean, I feel like in some ways some people are going to take the hit on this. And are they taking the hit on this because they didn't tell us? Uh, because frankly, and I'll just make this last point, these problems are huge. Mm -hmm. The only reason why this story got attention is there was something visual. There was mold on a wall. Yes, but the mold on the wall is, in fact, the tip of the iceberg. And so help me out because you're going and people are going to say it's going to be taken care of. And in two weeks from now or two months from now, how do we know it is? Well, sir, I, I agree with you. I, the, the mold uh, uh, is a brick and mortar issue. We, we've got it. We've got it fixed in Building 18. We're examining all the rest of the brick and mortar and medical command to make sure we don't have those kinds of issues. See, I think that's the easy part. Yes, sir. The second piece is is the thing I referenced, which is the the uh, heretofore not fully realized complexity of the injuries of these great young Americans. I'm, I'm a co-chair of the Mental Health Task Force, uh, Senators uh, Boxer and Lieberman. We're, we're coming to closure on our work this last year. The issues of mental health, PTSD, 
uh, late emerging PTSD, the issues of TBI, traumatic brain injury, how to diagnose it. I don't know it. what you're saying to me now. What right I'm now. saying What's is these point? are very complex patients that are severely injured in multiple emotional, physical, and uh, mental ways. And, and, and then finally, uh, sir, we're going to have a long-term challenge to continue to care for these soldiers and their families over time. I mean, time. We, we know that. I guess what I'm trying to understand sir. is how, how does it get solved? How many caseworkers do we have? How, how, what is the workload of each caseworker? Sir, those average about 1 to 25 to 1 to 30. Okay. Under oath, you're saying that's what it is? Yes, sir. Okay. So why would uh, 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 you know, Sergeant Shannon uh, basically have to find his own way and have to find his own caseworker without his caseworker finding him? I feel like these men and women are almost in prison in the bureaucracy. I mean, they, they, they could be here. It's kind of like the old song of the Kingston Trio, you know, in the subway underneath Charlie, the... Charlie, Charlie, yeah, MPA. Yeah. It, that's the way it feels to me. So t explain that to me. Sir, uh, um, it's absolutely right. We did not have a foolproof system to hand off our inpatients to the outpatient care. We had a system that probably was accurate about 80% of the time. About 20% of the time, and I assume Sergeant Shannon fall into that group, we did not do a good handoff of those patients so that he went from being an inpatient on one of our wards to uh, his platoon sergeant and his case manager picking him up. So, um, Ms. Bassetta, maybe you could help me out. You write these reports. They're available to Congress. They're available to, to uh, the press, even the press. Um, so this is nothing new. All of us, in a sense, are made aware of these problems. Um, how do you know when the problem is being addressed? And how do you get around, and how do we deal with people telling us they're being addressed when they're not? Well, when we make rec recommendations, we always follow up on those recommendations to ensure that they've been implemented. Um, but in this case, we've been very frustrated that um, we bring things to DOD's attention over and over, and we see that they fix um, certain problems on an individual basis, but the systemic fixes don't seem to happen. And sometimes I think that part of the problem is that the rules and regulations are so monumental that uh, we're focused more on that and not on the patients. And this is what I think, and I'll conclude with the few seconds I have left. Mm -hmm. I believe that basically it's part of your mindset that says if you're not going to get the resources, your job is to basically come to Congress and say we're getting the job done. And, and that I feel like, and, and, and frankly, that, that's almost, not almost, it's being dishonest. It's being dishonest to yourself and it's being dishonest to us. And, and I will look forward to the day when, when someone who's in a uniform comes to us and says, under oath, uh, I'm not giving the resources I need to do my job. Mr. Chairman, may I respond to that? Briefly. I've said this, sir, in public. Uh, the Congress has given U.S. Army Medical Command under my command everything I've asked for in terms of resources. The challenge is in some of the issues that we're addressing, which is how do we best apply those resources to best care for soldiers and then hand them off to the VA. I agree with you. There are issues. There are gaps in the system, both electronic medical records, handoffs. I've assigned uh, Army Do, personnel I, I in the VA. I understand my so, time's up. But yes, you, what you're saying, though, under oath, is that you have all the resources necessary to your sir, job. Uh, my, my and I honestly don't believe that. Yes, I don't believe it. Okay. Well, I, I think Mr. Duncan made the point of $450 billion in the defense budget, and, it, and maybe I, I think there's some, uh, some truth to the matter that there's resources there and it's priorities, but I hear your point as well. Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I, I've, I've read this uh, record pretty, pretty uh, thoroughly, and, and, and General Whiteman, Whiteman uh, I have to say that uh, you having only been in in this position for six months, you probably have a little bit more blame being laid at your doorstep than I think is probably appropriate. I just want to get that on the record from my, my reading of this. Uh, Ms. Pacetta, uh, you're aware that uh, GAO conducted a, uh, a review of uh, the Army system for evaluating the fitness of wounded soldiers to stay in the service? Yes. Okay. 
I'm just stuck on this number. Uh, I noticed that it, the Navy has a, an approval rate of about 35 percent for those who apply for, for uh, you know, retirement for uh, through disability. And the, the Air Force, uh, their, their approval rate is around 24 percent. Then I noticed the Army, uh, which has a greater number of individuals uh, applying, has an approval rate of about 4 percent. Now, uh, I'm just curious if you, you looked at that. It, I know you just did the Army, but did you look as a, as a comparison as what's going on? And, and could you help me with this? Uh, could you explain why those numbers look the way they do? What I can tell you is that um, in our review of the disability system, we noticed, first of all, that um, the services don't always follow the same procedures. But more importantly, uh, they don't have an, a quality assurance mechanism in place to assure that the decisions that are made are consistent across across the services. And um, I, uh, without knowing that, it's difficult to explain whether the, whether the variations that you're seeing in those um, award rates are reasonable or not. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. Recently, the uh, Secretary of Defense appointed an independent panel uh, to review to review all of this. Now, it's it's a it's an independent uh, review commission. It's uh, headed by uh, former Secretary Togo West and, and also former Secretary Jack Marsh, uh, both outstanding individuals. But I, I just question whether it's independent. Both of these uh, men are. Uh, are just they're, they're just top notch, but they are army to the core. And uh, just wondering if uh, if if we're looking for an independent review, truly independent, someone that can be self that can be critical of this whole process. I just question in in your own mind in conducting a review like this. And while I have again, I have enormous respect for uh, Togo West and, and Jack Marsh, but uh, I'm wondering if these are the best people for an independent and impartial. Uh, review since these two men I know absolutely love the United States Army and uh, I'm questioning whether or not they can be objective about the problems here. I can certainly understand your concern. I can tell you that um, there is a lot of work going on uh, reviewing d the disability systems both in the VA and in the DOD. There's a Veterans Benefits um, Commission that is looking at um, those issues now and the discrepancies between the ratings that are that are uh, given in the DOD, um, and comparing them to those uh, that are given in the VA for the same service members. Okay. And lastly, uh, before I yield back, uh, General Kiley, uh, I don't always trust uh, the newspapers, but the Post had a, uh, a, some quotes that uh, you thought that uh, that uh, the story was unfair. I know the the Chairman Waxman mentioned it a little earlier. Uh, and that you felt that this was not a, a, a failure uh, or a, a horrible situation at, at, at Walter Reed. Your, your, uh, your comments were in, in conflict with the Secretary of the Army on the same issue. He said there was definitely a, a failure and that it was inexcusable. Inexcusable was the word he used. Uh, are your own thoughts the same as you sit here today that uh, – uh, you thought this was uh, a one-sided uh, report and that it, it didn't fairly uh, represent the situation? So i just make sure I'm clear on this. The, the original uh, reports about uh, the soldiers and the conditions, uh, Building 18, uh, again, I, I did not label that as yellow journalism. Uh, there was a follow-on article later that was focused on me that I had some concerns about and did uh, say in a private conversation to the Secretary that I thought it was yellow journalism. What I did say, and what you referenced, Mr. Lynch, was uh, earlier on my concern that uh, the issues in Building 18, which were clearly unacceptable, clearly unacceptable, and were a failure of leadership at the, at the junior level in that building, my concern for the American people and for the Army and for soldiers was that, that some of the descriptors in the larger uh, articles would be uh, construed as that the entire Walter Reed system was a failure and that soldiers were being left to languish, were forgotten and lost, and, and that, that Building 18 emblemized. And I don't disagree that a visual image makes a big difference. Uh, but I, I know that. I, the I don't have much time. Let me just ask you the, yes, these are the words, and you can tell me, Mr. sir. Lynch, if these, time if is actually expired, thinking. but we'll let you ask one quick question if you want. Okay, yeah. Well, the quote here is that uh, I'm not sure it was an accurate representation. 
Uh, it was a one-sided representation. Uh, it's not. It's not the Rich Carlton at Pentagon City. I want to reset the thinking. Uh, while we have some issues here, this is not a horrific, catastrophic failure at Walter Reed. I just want to know if that's. I don't trust new yes, sir, I, generally, I, I, and I, I just want I to find out if that's that. your thinking. I did say that, and I was not attempting to be at odds with Secretary Gates. I, I think we, we have some issues of leadership here, but we've got great facilities and a great medical system, and I just I was concerned that the whole thing would come down on the basis of some of these specific issues. Thank you, General. Uh, Mr. Waxman, you had one follow-on you want to ask? Uh, I'd like General uh, uh, Kiley and General Waitman just to answer yes or no. In light of the um, memo by... Uh, Mr. Garibaldi, <clears throat> the experience we've seen, do you think it was a mistake to have contracted out the services as, as was done? Well, certainly with, with our ability to look at what's happened, uh, I, I think it may, we probably could have done it better, maybe shouldn't have done it at all, I, I think. General Wait. Sir, I don't think it was a mistake. I think uh, we suffered from having a prolonged period between when we had the switch over. Thank you. Since, since 4 February, the contractor has done right. very well. Right. Thank you. Uh, General I wasn't arguing the contractor didn't do well, but do you think it was a mistake yes. to contract it out oh, rather than leave this alone? Sir, yeah. Mr. Davis, you follow on that? Just a quick, I mean, there was congressional interference in that as well, wasn't there? Yes, sir. And, and some doubt, and that stretched out the time period and yes, added uncertainty. Is that correct? Yes, sir. General Kiley, apparently those that are with you feel differently than you and I did about this. They've asked if uh, we could g get you somehow um, removed from this thing as, as quickly as possible. I was hoping the remaining members who have not asked questions yet, if you have questions you'd like to ask specifically of General Kiley, perhaps uh, you indicate that and we'll recognize the members and then we'll let General so, Kiley go and ask General Waitman and Ms. Pasquetta to stay just a bit longer for the rest, if that's okay with them. Uh, Mr. Cooper, you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Kiley, in today's Washington Post, it says, uh, quote, uh, this is referring to you, his last concern was his concern for the patient, said retired Colonel Robert M. Tabachnikov, Chief of Obstetrics and Gynecology under Kiley at Landstuhl in the mid-1990s. Tabachnikov said Kiley wanted him to discharge new mothers within 24 hours of delivery to keep beds free and counted phone calls as office visits. <laughs> Quote, he was more concerned for meeting requirements and advancing his own career. At last, it's catching up with him. His leadership style is being exposed. Do you have a comment? Well, I, I'm, needless to say, I don't think that's a fair characterization of what we were doing at Launchville Regional Medical Center at the time. Um, I mean, I'd be happy to, to address the specifics of the 24-hour discharge program, which mothers call for. They want to go home. Um, workload and capturing what we do instead of ignoring it. Uh, and, I, and I would, by the way, I differentiate uh, a mother who wants to go home at 24 hours from one that has to go home at 24 hours. That, we never did that. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure I, I need to comment any more on it than that. I, the doctor, uh, the doctor worked for me at Launchstool, uh, as I remember, back in the uh, 90s. How about office visits uh, becoming telephone calls? Well, th the question there was my, my providers uh, felt frustrated that the work they did talking to patients wasn't counting uh, as part of the uh, workload that the hospital Ooh. did that got credit for so that we could get more money. Uh, that there was an issue of, you know, if, if I spend 20 minutes on the phone with a patient, that's, that ought to be an office call. And uh, we had no way to capture that data, as I remember, and quote, get credit for it, which is, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a game and it's not necessarily about workload. Um, I, I've spent my entire life uh, taking care of patients, training doctors to take care of patients. Uh, and I'm committed to Army medicine and committed to taking care of soldiers and their families. So I, I, I take exception to his view of me as uh, you know, doing all this just for a career and not caring about patients. I don't think that's correct. Mr. Chairman, I have Thank one you, quick question. I yes, Ms. Fox. Thank you. Um, thank you, General Kiley. <laughs> I, I want to ask, you mentioned at the beginning that what needs to be done is simplification. Yes, ma'am. We're interested again in accountability, and I think simplification needs to be done too. Do you feel confident that you can institute simpler measures of accountability, simpler ways of getting the job done that will stick? I think most people are concerned, as um, some of the previous witnesses said 
that all we're doing is going to paint over this issue. What I'm interested again in is systemic change. And systemic change that's not just going to work here at Walter Reed, as you said, but that's going to work throughout the system and that perhaps could be a model for other government agencies. So tell us how we're going to know, as some of the other questions have been asked, how are we going to know that this process is better? How can we monitor it? How can we make sure that it's going to go system-wide? I think that's a very good question. I think we need to transform it first, because if we just apply more uh, yardsticks and bells and whistles to the present process, uh, we'll just get much better at measuring bells and whistles. Uh, I think we need to uh, relook uh, the, uh, uh, the relationship between the MEB and the PEB, which is, in fact, in many re regards, despite the best efforts of both groups of people, adversarial. I mean, the physician is attempting to capture all the data, make sure the, the soldier is as healed as he or she is going to be, and, and make sure you've got an accurate record with tests, et cetera, hand it to the, the physical evaluation board, which is driven by, by law, by, by DOD regulations and, and by regs, to, to portion out disability in a system that doesn't recognize the whole person like the VA system does. And all that sets up an immediate, an immediate adversarial role uh, where, frankly, in some cases, nobody wins on this thing. And I think the Army is taking this on uh, uh, even as we speak. I know I'm taking it on to look at the process inside our organizations like Walter Reed with the MEB process and the kickback. But I think we're going to have to re we're going to have to reduce 22 different forms to fill out to go through this process. Uh, it may be as simple as getting rid of a line of duty and commander statements. Let's start giving the benefit of the doubt to the soldier that when they come back from Iraq missing a limb, that was in the line of con line of duty. It was combat. And, and we don't need somebody to, to send us a pe piece of paper to validate it. I think we've also got to understand it's going to take time for these soldiers to heal. Let's give them the den for the doubt, retire them, and then in three to five years, if they've fully recovered, we can bring them back and process them. But we do now, because we want to give the soldiers the best chances, we hold on to them. And so our numbers grow at all our installations. Uh, some of them feel like they're being pushed out too quickly. We say, we've got it. We figured out what's going on with you. And then the last piece, again, I say is we have still not come to grips with the PTSD TBI process that most all of these soldiers, to one extent or another, have to deal with. And those are not particularly well recognized uh, to date, uh, particularly in the uh, physical disability system. Uh, I hope to bring some light to that with the Mental Health Task Force and the Traumatic Brain Injury Task Force that I launched last fall to start looking at those. Thank you. Uh, thank you, General. General, once again, your plans have changed, and uh, you no longer have an appointment uh, later today. That's been postponed. So we're <laughs> just going <laughs> to we're just going to fire right through in our regular sure. order and, and see if we can uh, yes, bring sir. this panel to a conclusion. Because we appreciate the time that you spent so far. If members don't feel they have a question to uh, to present this time that has already been asked, that's perfectly fine as well. Uh, we'll try to go as quickly as we can. Maybe some members won't feel as compelled to do a complete five minutes as, as others. Uh, so, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, General Kiley, General Waitman, Ms. Vesqueta. Uh, appreciate all of your testimony and your service to our nation, and especially uh, uh, to both our generals, your many years of service in uniform. Um, in a previous question, uh, Representative Shays talked about the, the bricks and mortar maybe being the easier things to, yes, to see and fix, and the second challenge is greater. And, and I kind of put that in the human capital management of how we use the people we have to provide the service. And a common theme that seems to come across in the GAO finding, and, and you've talked about, is that handoff. Uh, and, and it was well identified uh, in the first panel, and I, I think we all agree with Staff Sergeant Shannon, Specialist Duncan, Corporal and Mrs. McLeod. Their stories are just unacceptable and, and shouldn't happen. And, and you look at Staff Sergeant Shannon, five days after he is shot, and, and seriously injured in Iraq, he is basically put into outpatient here, which speaks volumes about how quickly we got him here, but within five days of that traumatic you know, uh, injury that he's on his own and, and basically given a map. And that, that handover obviously didn't happen. How, how confident are you today that that handover first from inpatient to outpatient is not the case anymore and that there is a, a, a smoother transition? 
Sir, I, I am absolutely confident uh, that we have a system now in place that we have a physical handoff from the inpatients to outpatients. Is, but is you, that to the case manager or to the platoon sergeant? To the platoon sergeant, okay. sir. And but but there, as you spoke to, there's multiple handoffs because you know once they become an outpatient, you have to you have to hand off their care to the MEB process, and then you have to hand off their care to the PEB process, and then you you may very well have to hand off their care to the VA. And those are the those are the transitions that I think that we feel that we need to put a lot more work into. That's where we have failed. Well, that, that was my follow-up. The, the first one being in to outpatient, and and then it seems like to these soldiers and their families that once they got there, there there's there's no one place that here's who I'm supposed to be dealing with to get the care and support I need, and and that is very much on the radar now. I, I'm, I'm hearing you say, and and it, it, and we're we're seeking to address. Yes, sir. The, the specifically on the handoff VA, um, if I understood your, your oral testimony, uh, Ms. Pascetta, is that within a few weeks back um, that there was a DOD decision to deny VA physicians access to DOD medical records as part of that handoff, and is that still the case? I can't tell you what the current situation is. I can tell you that it was reported. Uh, I believe it was on February 16th that their access in the these are the VA physicians in the polytrauma centers that had their access cut off without warning. Um, General Kyler, are you aware? Is that the situation today? Or? As I understand it, as I sit here today, yes, sir, it is. Uh, I think the uh, the access uh, that was denied to the VA physicians comes out of the Joint pa uh, Patient Tracking System. And that's a database that picks up patients, uh, uh, troops as they enter into the system coming out of the theater of operations through launch tool and back to uh, <coughs> CONUS based facilities. And in that system, doctors that have uh, access to JPTA and are authorized to be entering clinical data about patients <coughs> enter clinical data. Uh, as I understand it, uh, just through a couple of emails, uh, at some point uh, someone recognized that, th that all physicians in the VA had access to the joint patient tracking system. And th that our lawyers, uh, and I don't mean my lawyers, but I believe it was DOD health affairs lawyers, I don't know that for sure, but that's my suspicion, said you know, that, that had the potential to be a HIPAA violation because if, if a soldier coming back um, is not necessarily a designated patient for a VA physician, then that, that physician really doesn't have a need to know about that data. Are, are, we, are we getting in to make sure that the VA physicians who do have a need to know retain the access? Because it sounds like what we've done is shut off everybody. I think, I think we have, sir, and I don't know where we are. Frankly, I've been if, working If we could have a, a follow-up yes, uh, to can the take that. on that, yes, that sir. would be, I think, yes, very sir. helpful. And, uh, yes, sir. If I may, a final quick question on the case manager. Uh, issue is um, in, in the earlier testimony, uh, Mr. McLeod talked about a case manager denying an MRI uh, that a doctor had ordered. Is, is that permissible and does that occur? Because it seems contrary to everything we want where the, the medical professionals are making the decisions. Uh, that, sir, that is not permissible and it, it should not occur. It, it does. And how that, that probably manifest itself out is that case manager is responsible for scheduling that exam. So if that case manager does not schedule the exam, it is essentially denied. It, but it, but they, they do not have the ability to overrule that. Is there disciplinary action if, if that comes to light that they overrode the... Absolutely, because the doctor's order takes precedence. Thank, thank the gentleman, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yamath. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> In listening to both this panel and the panel that preceded it, it seems like we have two problems we're dealing with. One is finding out about problems and whether there is an adequate um, system in place to uncover these problems. And the second one, problem, of course, is how we find out what to do about it and who's responsible for that. Um, in today's Washington Post story, for instance, there was a mention that we are getting reports now from all over the country, call, people calling and families calling journalists, even from my own state, Fort Knox and Fort Campbell, and reporting similar problems. My question is, one could infer from listening to this that the Army relies on people telling the next level of uh, the next rank about problems rather than there being some kind of accountability, some kind of a mandate on the commander to say, this is part of our job to find out whether the proper service is being rendered at every level. Um, is there a deficiency there? Is, are we relying on a bottom-up type of reporting mechanism, or do you see that as a problem or not? Sir, I, 
I, I think there has been a failure. We have three or four different mechanisms here at Walter Reed for patients and patient family members to tell us about about issues that they have, whether it's IG complaints, whether it's commander's open door policy, whether it's uh, surveys that, that come out, uh, that we do periodic surveys, the town hall meetings, the newcomers orientations you've heard about. Based on those, uh, I feel that for whatever reason, we were not getting an adequate feedback from the patients and from the patient family members about all of the concerns that they, they had. But it, is it, don't you think that proper management technique would be that the, the highest level of management, and I'm not necessarily putting it on your desk, maybe it should be in the Pentagon, uh, has to create ways and actually has to make an affirmative effort to find out whether proper service is being given at every level? Is that not a responsibility yes, sir. of the in highest my, command? Yes, sir. In my role as MedCom commander, I have accountability to the Army uh, across all the installations, uh, similar to Walter Reed. Uh, holding my commanders, uh, both the regional flag officers and the individual local hospital commanders accountable uh, for the health care uh, uh, delivery uh, in conjunction with uh, you know, General Wilson, uh, who manages, uh, often manages the infrastructure solutions. And I send, uh, I send teams out, uh, the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Army sends teams out, I send my IG out, uh, and we visit. Uh, all the posts and camps over the year, uh, uh, getting assessments. Additionally, you know, we talk to the commanders, we talk to the regional commanders, ask them how things are going, and then we report. They report data up to us about processes. I, I will say that uh, I don't. Um, I don't get involved at my level, and I'm not sure the regional commanders would get involved in their level at an individual issue like a case manager who denies an MRI. But I would agree with General Waitman. Uh, we, we need to do a better job of, and we will do a better job of defining the roles and missions of the case managers and platoon sergeants, and we have evolved these processes uh, so that uh, we don't have cases like this coming up. Sir, if I may add on to that, you know, under General Kiley's direction over the last four months, there's been a survey conducted every couple of weeks looking at um, patient satisfaction with their case managers and with their providers, and they take different samples of all the different regions, and that's anonymous. You know, that just goes up. You know, the most recent one that was done at the end of January showed patient satisfaction with their case manager and with their provider, their physician, to be over 90%. But well, that's not what we've heard, you know, here. So are we looking at the wrong uh, population, or do we, are we making it too hard for them to tell us what their concerns are? We had the Army Family Action Plan meeting here recently, which had very good representation from the med hold and the med hold over patients, and, and you know, almost none of these issues were raised there. So that's obviously a failure in our, our sampling technique to get the feedback that we need. Thank you, sir. My time's expired. Thank you. I think Mr. Duncan is out of the room briefly, so uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Kiley, General Waitman, um, you know, obviously it, it, it's very difficult in listening to the first panel and then, then listening to the, the statements um, that, that you are making concerning um, the current status of things, what needs to be done. Um, it, there, there is a disconnect. Um, you know, I, I hear the difficulty uh, that the, uh, the families and uh, our servicemen and women are having, and then I hear the, um, uh, it's, it's not happening now or we'll fix it or, a um, case manager doesn't have that authority, but yet a case manager apparently um, has uh, <clears throat> uh, gone against a doctor's recommendation with respect to scheduling an MRI. Um, <clears throat> the, these things are, are very troubling, and the, my, my understanding from both of you is that both of you are saying with respect to Building 18 <clears throat> that, um, that neither one of you were aware of the conditions of that building. Is that a correct characterization of what you've said? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Well, I guess my question comes to, well, how did you not know? Uh, General Waitman, this is not that big of a facility. Uh, it, it, did you really testify that there are 371 outpatient rooms? Yes, sir. And, and that, General Kylie, in looking at your testimony, you've got, <clears throat> in spite of efforts to maintain Building 18, the building will require extensive repairs, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's going to remain in service. Uh, this is not a question of, of that people weren't satisfied with their accommodations. This is... A, a situation where it doesn't meet our standards. I agree. Um, yes, so sir. what went wrong? How did you two not know that we had something 
where we had people being housed, not in just that they weren't satisfied, but that it doesn't meet our standards, and, and yet they were being housed there. General Kiley? Uh, sir, I, I don't. I can't explain that. I, I, uh, I, I, it's been pointed out. I live across the street, but I don't do barracks inspections at Walter Reed. In my role as a MedCom commander, um, you know, I have subordinate commanders across MedCom that do those things if they think there are problems and they're aware of them. Uh, I would certainly inspect any barracks if, if asked to come look at it, or if we had a problem we couldn't fix of one kind or another. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sorry. During my initial orientation here, when I came, I walked through many barracks. I did not walk through Building 18. Okay. Well, John Kiley, then this gets back to, to my question of, of, of uh, systems. You said you do not do inspections. Um, I don't think anyone would think that the system that you have in place as a manager of an organization would be sufficient if your answer is that you don't do inspections, but yet you, you still did not know. I mean, there's something wrong with the organizational structure if we all have to hear from the Washington Post yes, sir. versus that there are facilities, and again, not just that don't meet the standards. It's not like they thought that their accommodations weren't acceptable. They don't meet our standards, but yet they were being housed there. And you two gentlemen who were given the responsibility and being in charge, um, and again, as you said, General Kiley, uh, you know, Congress can only appropriate funds, pass laws, and the government can pass rules and regulations, but there are people, individuals, who have, have to implement this. Uh, so you can see why people would be very disturbed. Yes, sir, I can. General Kiley, I have one, another question for you. I believe that you said that you were not aware, or you, you were not prepared for the complexity of the injuries that these soldiers, or the complexities of the injuries were not fully realized um, for these, these soldiers. Uh, what was the plan uh, then? What, what was your expectation? 